Baseball season is back upon us here in Oxford, Ohio. McKee Field at Hayden Park is the scene for today's matchup between the Purdue-Fort Wayne Mastodons and the Miami Red Hawks. I'm Bennett Wise. Alongside is Chris Vanell. And Chris, it's been a long time coming. I know we've both been waiting here for baseball season. Yeah, I've been pretty excited. I mean, did you sleep last night? Because I didn't sleep last night. I was waiting to get back, sitting next to you, enjoying some baseball. I've been waiting for this moment. I, I slept fairly well. You know, I slept like a rock, <laughs> but as soon as my alarm went off at 9.30 this morning, I knew it was baseball time. And I know even for these Miami Red Hawks, they have some replacements to do. I know this is the first broadcast of the year here on, on Red Hawk Radio. And uh, Danny Hayden's squad, you know, two, two wins already in this series, and now the series finale coming in. They have a freshman on the mound in Kent Negbert. Yeah, and he's a guy who's going to be re re relied upon to replace Spencer Mraz, their top starter from a year ago who, who went to the minor leagues. And, and Danny Hayden's really high on Egbert. We'll see what he's got today in his second start. So now Ken Negbert takes and sets the first pitch of the game is tapped back off the bat of the second baseman Aaron Chapman. He's a sophomore out of Waterford, Wisconsin as Miami will have this lineup defensively. Parker Massman out in left, Christian Tejada in center field. Landon Stevens, normally in the infield last year, making the start out in right field today. Ken Nagbert now coming set. We'll get you the rest of the lineup here in a second as the freshman righty throws home again. And that is a fastball right down the middle at 89 to get the count to 0-2. Left side of the infield for the Red Hawks, Brian Zapp, another freshman in the lineup. The transfer out of Duke, Tyler Wardwell gets the start at shortstop. Will Vogel saying at second base and Charlie Harrigan at first as Egbert now with the 0-2 tries to go with a little bit of off speed on the changeup inside and misses. It's 1-2. and two. The Mastodons here with Aaron Chapman. He'll be followed by Jack Ling and Garrett Lake. Chapman yesterday 1-4 for four with a run scored and two strikeouts as Egbert comes set and from the stretch the 1-2 comes home off the end of the bat right and it's fair up the right field line. Chapman rounds first. He's charging for second. The ball's still in the right field corner. It's picked up by Landon Stevens. Chapman goes all the way to third, a leadoff triple for the Mastodons. Stevens a little slow getting that ball out of the corner in right field. He's not a guy we've seen there in the past. He played a lot of third and second base last year, moving to the outfield to fill some holes this year, and he's going to have to grow into that position. Yeah, last year was it was McKay Williams taking that spot, and, you know, Last game we saw from McKay Williams was in the MAC semifinal up in Cleveland, and he had a scary tumble into the right field wall when he was trying to go for diving play. He luckily was okay and recovered. But now the Red Hawks have a runner, or rather the Macedons have a runner on third, and Aaron Chapman as Egbert throws home, and it's fouled off behind home plate by the shortstop Jack Lang. He's a junior out of Fishers, Indiana. Red Hawks got the win yesterday, 7-3, 6-2 win on Friday. So trying to go for the series sweep. Egbert from the stretch. Right, looks home, a big deep breath. Now kicks and fires home. Pitch misses upstairs, 90. Lang nearly got called for a strike on a check swing. Evens up the count at one aside. Overall, starting to be a beautiful day here in Oxford. It was 45 degrees at first pitch, partly cloudy skies, wind 10 to 15 miles an hour out of the south-southwest, going from home plate towards center field as this ball is grounded to third base. It is picked up by Brian Zapp, and it goes with Harrigan, who then collides with Jack Lang. The runner from third, Chapman, comes home to score, and it's one nothing Mastodons. The play was exactly how you draw it up for the Red Hawks. Get a ground ball to third base, holds the runner at third. The throw on the first was just wide, allowing to run the score. So it went from good to bad very quickly for the Red Hawks, and they're down one nothing. So this is just the second start for Kent Egbert, the freshman out of Tip City, Ohio. Started the third game of the series against Texas A&M. Went five innings, six hits, three earned runs allowed, two walks, five strikeouts. Gave up a double and two home runs to the Aggies, as now the Macedons have a runner on first. Quick glance over to first, the pitch comes home. That is a changeup getting the outside part of the plate for a strike, a righty-lefty matchup here against Garrett Lake. one nothing Macedons here, top of the first. Jack Lang at first, Garrett Lake at the plate as he awaits the 1-0 and swings and misses.
So, uh, last play will officially go down as an E5. That'll go against Brian Zapp. That's his first error of the year. Egbert now comes set. Another righty-lefty matchup. Quick look over to first and now comes home. The fastball misses high at 89, and it's one and two. And again, Chris, this is just, a, in general, a very young pitching staff. Egbert, just a freshman. They had a lot of arms they have to replace. 70% of their innings from last year they have to replace. And I mentioned Spencer Mraz, but the other big one in the bullpen is Shane Smith. And they see a couple guys who can replace him. High chopper back to the mound. It's picked up by Egbert. He makes a calm throw to first for out number one. They see a couple guys who can replace Shane Smith. Grant Hartwig, who was on the team a couple years back, missed all of last year with Tommy John surgery. He's a guy who Danny Hayden earlier in the week mentioned as you know, a possible replacement for Shane Smith, eating up the late innings and kind of closing out the ball game, especially early on in the weekend, freeing up the bullpen for the rest of the weekend. If you look at the amount of innings from last year, the only returners are Sam Bachman, Tyler Bosma. Both of them are starters. John Meyering and Bailey Volstecki, so a lot of people to replace in the bullpen. And now this is the first pitch to Alex Evenson. He's in the designated hitting spot, and he fouls off the first one down the third baseline. It's 0-1. Mastodons in their away black jerseys, gold trim at the neck and the sleeves, gray pants. Miami, is this the Phillies look with the pinstripes on the bottom and the red script up top? I believe so, yeah. Red hat, red bills for the Red Hawks. Script M on the front as getting a good piece of this is Evenson down the left field line. This could be trouble, and it is called foul. One hopped up against the wall, and that puts the count at 0-2. Still a still runner on second for the Macedons. Last year on Sundays, we saw the Red Hawks go to their uh, super old-looking jersey. It's like a cream color, 1911 inspired by the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah, they donned those yesterday. Still a great look. Changing up, you know, on a Sunday. Yeah. No balls, two strikes. Still in the top of the first. Purdue Fort Wayne leading one to nothing. Jack Lang at second base. Egbert takes a look back. And now the 0-2 comes home, getting a good piece of this. Again, down the left field line. Charging back is Parker Massman. And one hops up against the wall. It's fair. Jack Lang being sent home. He scores an RBI double for Purdue Fort Wayne. So Macedon's trying to get at least a win here in the series, avoid the sweep. They went 3-1 and one in their first series against the Longwood Lancers. That was in Farmville, Virginia. And now in Oxford, Ohio, trying to get another win here on the road. So Alex Evenson is on second base after that RBI double. This brings up Garrett Muller to the plate, the redshirt senior out of New Haven, Indiana. Egbert looks back, comes home, and this one's sent up the middle. Wardwell diving play, makes the throw from his knees, scooped up by Harrigan, and he is called out. Great effort by Tyler Wardwell, another guy who you have to replace somebody in the middle infield. You move Vogel saying over to second base, and you get a transfer from Duke, which always helps. Yeah, Danny Hayden's really high on Wardwell as well. And, and we've seen some solid defensive play the last couple years from the Red Hawks. We had Carlos Texador two years ago, and then last year Will Vogel saying, who's now at second base. Lots of defensive uh, glove flashing out there at shortstop. Wardwell, too, already has two errors on the year. Avoided disaster there and a great reach by Harrigan at first. It's down on one knee at one point as the first pitch from Egbert is inside on the righty Robert Young. Redshirt senior out of Indianapolis, 235 hitter on the year, 3 for 13 at the plate. This is Alex Evenson at third base. He takes a slight lead, two outs in the top of the first. Macedon's up 2-0 here on the Red Hawks. Egbert, the 1-0, high fastball, 92 that time, gets a young swing. One ball, one strike. So already an error here by the Red Hawks. That cost him a run. That's a leadoff triple by Aaron Chapman. As a nasty curveball this time, 73 gets Young swing. It's one and two. RBI double by Alex Evenson, who now stands at third base. Brought home Jack Lang. 
Now Robert Young the third tries to extend the inning for Purdue Fort Wayne. One ball, two strikes. Egbert comes set. The righty takes a deep breath, doesn't even look towards third base. Comes home, fastball, got him swinging, and that'll do it here for the top of the first. Two runs scored on two hits, one error defensively by the Red Hawks, and run runner left on base by the Macedons. We will have the bottom of the first coming up next here on Red Hawk Radio. Chris Vanell and Bennett Wise back with you for the bottom of the first from McKee Field at Hayden Park. The Mastodons up 2-0 after Aaron Chapman scored on an error. And then Alex Evenson drove him home on an RBI double as Christian Tejada takes the first pitch from the starter. Tyler Kissinger, a righty out of Fort Wayne, Indiana, playing for his home school. Get you the starting lineups for the Macedons in a second as the 1-0 comes home. Fastball on the inside edge for a strike, and it's 1-1 one one on the righty Tejada. So behind the plate for the Macedons, it is Dylan Stewart. Left side of the infield, Garrett Muller and Jack Lang is now the 1-1. One one. Misses low in the dirt, tried to go with a curveball, dropped too low, 2-1. Two right side of the infield is Aaron Chapman at second, and at first base is Travis Up. Outfield from left to right, Robert Young the third, Garrett Lake, and Lucas Kolovitz getting the start for the Mastodons as Christian Tejada is hit on the elbow and he'll take his base. First runner aboard for the Red Hawks. As that'll bring up Will Vogel saying somebody you don't necessarily want to put with a runner on first. Rather, you don't want to bring him up to the plate with a runner on first as the senior from Cincinnati, Ohio has made teams pay in the past. He's had a little bit of a power surge to start this year, too. Only one home run all of last year. He's got two this year already, so must have been hitting the weight room in the offseason. Senior getting a lot of experience as he awaits the first pitch from Kissinger, and that will have to wait as Tejada slides back into first safe, safely. Excuse me. Tyler Kissinger, a senior, getting his second start of the year, 1-0 and at for his record after beating Longwood, six and a third innings. No earned runs, just three hits allowed as Kissinger accepts the signs. A quick nod, pitch comes home. Good rip into left center field. Going back is Garrett Lake, and that one is gone. Third home run of the year for Will Vogelsang, and just like that, the Red Hawks have tied it up at two apiece. It made me look smart there for a minute. I was just talking about his power surge, and here we go, third home run in just six games. You know, it's not its not even May when the ball starts flying out in the heat. It's 45 degrees out here, and Will Vogelsang's hitting bombs. He had two home runs yesterday by the Red Hawks, one from Vogelsang and the other from Steven Krause, who's now in the on-deck circle as Landon Stevens steps into the right side batter's box to face Kissinger. 
And on one swing, we have a tie ball game. Bottom of the first two runs for both the Mastodons and the Red Hawks. As Kissinger comes set from the windup, throws home with a curve ball. That was high and inside on Stevens, the righty, and it's 1-0. Great righty-righty matchup here. Stevens, a senior out of Hamilton, Ohio. Eight for 19 to start his senior season as he takes a fastball high and in near the hands. It's 2-0. and And this is the second straight season. Before last season and this season, I asked Danny Hayden, who's the one guy you saw the most improvement from during the offseason? Last season, Landon Stevens. This year, once again, Landon Stevens. So Hayden's really looking for him to step up and become an elite ball player at the college level in the senior year. Now fastball at 88, misses upstairs. Three balls, no strikes here on Stevens. Nobody out in the bottom of the first. Red Hawks trying to regain a lead here as now Kissinger with, takes a little bit off his fastball. 89 right down the middle, it's three and one. Safe approach there by Stevens too, with a 3-0 count, choosing not to swing, try and get the walk. Stevens went three for five yesterday. As the pitch comes home, he takes a swing, fouls it off behind home plate. Dylan Stewart rips off the mask, but it heads into the concourse, and the count's full. And a home run by Will Voglesang out to probably, what, 390 feet in the left center gap. It's 332 down the left field line, 343 down the right, 400 to Dedaway Center. Now the payoff comes home. Steven swings and misses. Strikeout number one for Tyler Kissinger. Puts one out on the board, and Steven Krause to the plate for the Red Hawks. Number 20, Steven Krause. Krause redshirted last year, starting to get a lot of playing time so far this year. He's four for 10 from the plate, has a double, a triple, and a home run. And he's a guy, Chris, that we taught him just last semester, I should say two semesters ago. It's in our Journalism 101 class. Yeah. Fairly quiet guy. Four. Yeah. Yeah. What do you say, about second row every time? Smart kid. That's one ball, no strikes, one out. Here, bottom of the first, Kissinger comes home. That is a fastball. It skips up in the dirt. Backhand to grab by the catcher, Dylan Stewart, and it's 2-0. and Red Hawks currently with a record of 2-3, and three, trying to get back to 500 after being swept last week by the Texas A&M Aggies. That was a 21st-ranked Aggie team at that. As Grouse checks his swing, fastball in the middle. That's 2-1. and one. Kissinger taking his time. Kraus in the right side batter's box. Rips one down the left field line, but it's foul. Heads off of the batting cages down there in left field. Always got to keep Danny Hayden on his toes, too, down the third baseline. Two balls, two strikes, one out. Kraus calling for time as now the ball is being run down. It ended up at the warning track. Steven Krause, redshirt freshman from Wilmington, Ohio. One for two yesterday, had a home run, also walked twice. That was a two-run home, two home run at that in the 2-2. Two -two. Curveball comes home, another foul ball down the left field line. Kissinger taking his time as the sun keeps weaving in and out of the clouds. 2-2 is fouled off just down the first baseline behind the Mastodon's dugout. Count remains two balls and two strikes. Mastodon's currently sitting of a record of 3-3, three and three, have yet to play a home game. Still waiting on that, and they're going to have to wait because next week they'll be down in New Mexico taking on the New Mexico State. University Aggies as Steven Krause is hit just below his rib cage, and he'll walk to first with one out, and that'll bring up Charlie Harrigan. Got a curveball that didn't really curve there 
from Kissinger, and you know, that'll happen early on in the season. Your hands get a little cold, get a little clammy. Grip's not as good, and you don't get that wrist over. Now we're getting a mound visit. Tyra Infield coming in as well. Tyler Kissinger, two hit batters already here in the inning. Hit Christian Tejada to lead things off. Then Will Vogel saying a deep home run into to left center field to tie up the ball game at two apiece. Landon Stevens just struck out. Then Steven Krause was just hit by a pitch. And now we're going to have a righty-lefty matchup as the senior Charlie Harrigan is about to step into the left side. Talked about all the replacements that the Red Hawks have needed to do, mainly with the bullpen. But, you know, you get a guy like Harrigan last year, transfers in here, makes a difference from the start, gets the start at first base. And now you got somebody to back him up to, Michael Morissette from Tyler Junior College coming in this year. So just all around the depth on the offensive and defensive side is really there for Miami. Yeah, this might be the deepest team Miami has. And Danny Hayden's done it through recruiting, you know, guys out of high school. And he's also done it through the junior transfer way or just transfers in general. He's hoping Wardwell can be a guy like Harrigan was last year and McKay Williams was two years ago. Harrigan gets a curveball from Kissinger. Swings as it drops below the knees. It's 0-1 with one out. Still in the bottom of the first. Steven Krause stands at first base for the Red Hawks. Left side of the infield playing in for the Mastodons as Kissinger comes to that, a quick nod, and now the 0-1 comes home. Goes with a changeup that just misses on the outside part of the plate. Evens up the count, one aside, still one out. Ball on a strike, Steven Krause toying with Kissinger. And that wall is ripped into the left center field, and it one hops in front of Robert Young, and the Red Hawks have runners on first and second. Just a good late swing, tried to stay back on the pitch and got a good piece of it. Now runners on first and second, Steven Krause moves up to second base. Harrigan with that single. Goes to first, that brings up the sophomore out of Palo, Ohio, Cole Andrews making his second start of the year. And somebody who Chris last year made a pretty big difference as just a freshman. Yeah, Danny Hayden's not a throw, afraid to throw you out there on the field if you're talented and you've got some confidence early on in your career. Cole Andrews is one of those guys, and he'll look to improve even more in his sophomore year. Yeah, he started 40 games for the Red Hawks, appeared in 46 last year. 303 batting average as he gets a good piece of this. Out in the left field, Robert Young has had a day, and that ball goes over the wall. Three run shot for the Red Hawks. Cole Andrews with his first extra base hit of the year, and we have a 5 2 ball game so far in Oxford. Like I mentioned a second ago, I don't know what's happening today. We've got, you know, the ball's flying out of here like it's June. Steven, or rather, Cole Andrews, who all of last year had six home runs, gets his first of the year, drives home Steven Krause and Charlie Harrigan. It's now 5-2 to two Miami on just three hits. And now we're moved to the seventh spot, and Tyler Wardwell, who went 0-3 for 3 yesterday, trying to get a hit here today. He swings on the first pitch. That's a blooper. And it's gone and caught by the shortstop moving into shallow left center field. That is Jack Lang, and that's the second out of the inning as we move to the eighth spot in Brian Zapp. Brian. Offense so far coming alive for the Red Hawks. I mean, last year they had seven guys who hit above 300 moving the towards that direction here. I mean, that was a powerful Red Hawks team last year as the first pitch to zap from Kissinger is a fastball high and away 1-0. So that was a Red Hawks team of what? 37-19, what, 14-game win streak. Best 30-game start in program history at 29-6. and six. 
As now Zap getting under it a little bit too much. This is easy play for Robert Young the third. He squeezes the glove, makes the catch, and that will do it for the first inning. Five runs on three hits for the Red Hawks. Two home runs, one by Will Vogelsang, the other by Cole Andrews. And that is where we sit moving into the second inning. Coming up next here on Red Hawk Radio. to the top of the second inning here at McKee Field in Hayden Park. As Lucas Kolovitz in the seven hole today will face Kenton Egbert, whose first pitch as they change up, that misses low and inside on the lefty, it's 1-0. So the Mastodons got through their first six hitters in the first, scored two runs, and then Miami exploding two home runs, one by Will Vogelsang, the other by Cole Andrews as we sit at 5-2 in favor of Miami. As Egbert misses inside again, it's 2-0 here on Kolovitz. Big kick and deal. Change up high on the outside corner. Gets the call from the home plate umpire, Chuck Adya, and it's 2-1. And, and Egbert is talking with his grandparents, Dave and Janet before the game. His only offer coming out of high school was from the Miami Red Hawks. He took a visit down to Richmond, maybe one to OU, she said, but Miami, the only one who truly went after him. And this is a guy, too, who had an offer to go play in the minors, had a, had a, a nice contract, too, but turned it down because he wanted to come to Miami. Now the 2-2 is fouled off behind home plate, and that's where the count will remain. We were told nearly $200,000 is the offer, and I said as an 18-year-old kid, I'm taking it. I'm going straight to the nearest Porsche dealership <laughs> and becoming the coolest kid in my town. But Kenton Ebert, Egbert, you know, a little smarter than I am. <laughs> Tell you what, that's a mature decision as the 2-2 tries to go with the changeup, but a little bit of an early release as it misses outside on the lefty and it puts the count full. And like I said earlier, Danny Hayden has a lot of confidence in his young right-hander. I mean, to be a weekend starter in the second weekend of your freshman year and already having one start under your belt, You've got high potential. Payoff comes home, tries to go again with a changeup, and it misses high and away. That is just the third walk of the year for Kent Egbert, making his second start, and the leadoff man is aboard for Purdue Fort Wayne. Brings up the first baseman, Travis Up, the senior out of LaPorte, Indiana. As he works with Kolovitz on first base, trying to get to Kent Egbert here again, just a freshman. Already in the starting rotation for Danny Hayden as he kicks and deals the first pitch. Ground ball towards shortstop. Got by Tyler Wardwell. Gets it to second for one. Vogelsang steps on the bag, but no throw to first. So a fielder's choice for Travis up. Again, still a runner on first with one out in the top of the second. Now to the bottom of the order, Dylan Stewart, sophomore out of Milford, Ohio, not too far from here, if I'm not mistaken. 40 minutes or so, 50 minutes. Learning my Cincinnati geography. I'll teach you, buddy, don't worry. 
Tell you what, though, you're out. You don't have any el any more uh, elder Panthers here. I know. Yeah. Shane Smith is gone. I've got a LaSalle Lancer in uh, Tyler Wardwell, another GCL boy. First pitch from Egbert, high and inside on the righty. It's 1-0. and One out here in the top of the second, 5-2 to two in favor of Miami. Stewart, 4 for 12 to start his sophomore year. As Travis Hupp takes a four-step lead off of first and a big hit out into left center field going back. Parker Massman near the warning track, and it goes off the scoreboard, a two-run shot. Now four runs scored here by the Mastodons. First home run of the year and of this game for Purdue Fort Wayne, and that's the first of the year for Dylan Stewart. So these Mastodons starting to figure out Egbert. Four runs on three hits. So now we move to the top of the order. Aaron Chapman, who led things off in this ball game with a triple, later came around to score on a throwing error. First pitch from Egbert, tries to go with a changeup that's fouled off behind home plate. Now pitching coach Matt Passer going out to, get to talk with a freshman and Chris you know, you got a little bit of inexperience, just a second start, second collegiate appearance ever, and, you know, starting to struggle here with, with the home run here, giving up here in the second. And he's leaving balls up at the moment. Even on that last pitch, he was up around the uh, lettering of the batter. So, so really, you go out there, you tell him, hey, take a deep breath, calm down. You've got this. You've got the talent. You're starting in just your second weekend of college baseball, and we're st we still have the lead. So pitch your game. <laughs> and go right after hitters. Don't try to dance around or make the perfect pitch because that's when you get hurt, like Stewart's home run. So, so far, three extra base hits allowed by Egbert, a triple and a double in the first, and then that home run by Dylan Stewart. And he now is at an 0-1-1 count here on Chapman with one out in the top of the second. Miami leading 5-4. to four. Three hits for each team. One error by Miami. That was committed at third base by Brian Zapp. Now from the windup, the 0-1, fastball just misses low and inside. One ball, one strike. Chapman came into this ball game 9 for 27 to start his year. That's 333 at the dish as the 1-1 comes home. Tries to go with a changeup, and it misses low and inside. Bounces up at the chest protector of Cole Andrews. Two balls and one strike. In the first, that was the first triple of the year for Chapman. Had a double, still looking for his first home run. Now the 2 1 comes home, a big leg kick by Egbert. And the fastball at 89 gets the inside part of the plate, 2 and 2. And that's exactly where Egbert wants to live. It was down around the knees and on the inner third of the plate. Egbert looking down at the wrist. They have now. The signs on their wrist, something that's kind of new for the pitchers. Normally it's the catcher who then relays the signal from the bench. And now a breaking ball, swinging and missing. Chapman goes down to one knee. That's the second strike out of the afternoon for Kenton Egbert and his seventh of the year. Now two away here in the top of the second. Jack Lang now steps in to the right side. A nice righty-righty matchup here for Kenton Egbert. Lang reached on the error in the first as a breaking pitch gets the wayside corner, and it's 0-1. Now you get Junior out of Fishers, Indiana, outside of Indianapolis. 9 for 22 coming into this ball game as he gets a curveball that drops to the dirt, and it's 1-1. Entire infield playing back for the Red Hawks. Trying to get out of this inning after a two-run home run by Dylan Stewart. 1-1 one, one comes home. Fastball misses low, and it's 2-1. and one. Red Hawks do have a righty up and warming in their bullpen. It looks to be number 28, Logan Schmidt. 
Get more information on him in a second as the 2-1 comes home. Skips up, backhanded grab by Andrews at the plate. Three balls and one strike. With two outs and nobody on, I presume that they think that Egbert, is just, he's going to be able to make it through this inning. He's got two outs, nobody on, and he's pitching well after the strikeout. Just got to go at hitters. And now the 3-1 fastball right down the middle. A great pitch on the outer edge, too, of that the plate. It's three balls and two strikes. Two outs again here in the top of the second. Do you think Egbert comes out for another inning if, if he gets this batter out? I would not be surprised if he did. And the 3-2 is fouled off to the right side and that's where the count will remain. He's only sitting with about 35 pitches right now and that's not too bad at all. And normally you want to max out around 20 per inning, I would say, to get a good start. Never want to go over 20. That's usually where you start dealing with some trouble. Is a 3-2 right over Egbert's head and into center field for a single. The thing with Egbert is he hasn't been wild outside of the strike zone. He's been a, lot, a little wild in the zone, leaving balls up, but he's not dancing around the plate. And the runs he's given up have been quick runs, whether it be home runs or just extra base hits. Now the lefty, Garrett Lake, he's a junior out of Henderson, Nevada. Had a high chopper right back to Egbert in the first, trying to get his first hit of the ball game. Has a runner on the first base back as this one's fouled off, nearly goes into the Red Hawks' dugout, which Matt Passer took a step back off that top step. Always got a fear when you're down there too. Coach Pass. He is exposed. He's probably standing on the turf right now. Has nothing to protect him in front of him. No balls in one strike. Egbert a quick look over to first, and the 0-1 comes home. Tries to go with a changeup, but it misses away. One and one. Garrett Lake on the season now. Six for 24. Has a double. Has. Also a triple, four RBIs. Egbert now getting the sign from the bench. Goes from the stretch. About a four-step lead off of first base for Jack Lang. Andrews setting up on the outside part of the plate. That's where the pitch goes. A fastball, and it puts the count in one and two. Ken Egbert, a righty. Garrett Lake, the lefty. Cole Andrews trying to go low in the zone. The throw over to first. Plenty of time for the pickoff, and they got him. Great awareness by Ken Egbert to get Jack Lang on the pickoff, and that will do it for the top of the second. Two hits by the Mastodons, a two-run home run by Dylan Stewart, and the Mastodons are only down by one. Miami put up five runs in the first, try to put up more as we move to the bottom of the second here on Red Hawk Radio.
for the bottom of the second, and Chris, the match non's already going to the bullpen. Yeah, new pitcher Trevor Armstrong. He's a junior righty, another hometown guy out of Fort Wayne, Indiana, and he has one appearance on the year. You know, came in, in relief one time in their opening series as Parker Massman drives this one towards right field. Right fielder will take care of it for out number one. Armstrong appeared in one game earlier in the year, threw two innings, and had an earned run average of 4.5, so he's a guy that the Red Hawks are hoping to get to, but Purdue Fort Wayne looking for him to give him some innings. So Tyler Kissinger's day is done at just one inning, allowed three hits, five earned runs, courtesy of two home runs, one by Cole Andrews, the other by Will Vogel, saying only one strikeout. So now the junior Armstrong, another righty, comes low with a curveball and drops to the dirt, 1-0 here against Christian Tejada as the Red Hawks move back to the top of the order. Tejada was hit by a pitch in the first. Second time this year he's been plunked and another curveball here by Armstrong and it misses inside down by the feet and it's 2-0. Oh. That's sort of the game plan too if you're the Red Hawks. You want to get the starter off the mound early and with five runs in the first that'll usually do it. It's the 2-0. Another slower pitch. That misses high and inside. It's three balls and no strikes. And kind of like Egbert, Kissinger only threw 25 pitches in that first inning, so it wasn't like he went out there and threw 60. The Red Hawks just jumped on him early. 3-0 fastball getting the inside part. Upper left part of the plate here against the righty Tejada, 3-1. One out in the bottom of the second. Red Hawks up 5-4 to four here on the Mastodons. Big deep breath by Armstrong, and he comes home. Fastball high and up and near the head of Tejada. He ducks out of the way and will move on to first. So still not an official plate appearance yet for Tejada as he was hit by a pitch and now walks. He's a guy that the Red Hawks will take on base any way they can get him as he's got some speed. Even that on base percentage from last year at four, four, uh, excuse me, .453. 45% of the time he came to the plate, he got on base. So they move now to Will Vogel saying at that two-run homer in the first. Same situation here as Tejada takes a sizable lead, starts to take off, but then retreats back to first as a curveball drops right down the middle for a strike. So again, the starter for the Mastodons, Tyler Kissinger, just one inning, three hits allowed, five earned runs. After going six and a third in his first start against Longwood, allowed three hits, no earned runs, and had eight strikeouts in that ball game. As Armstrong throws over to first, Tejada slides back safely. Still a fairly chilly day here at Oxford. Temperature hovering around 50 degrees. I have around 52 today. The sun's supposed to come out at some point, but still not making its way. As another throw over to first by Armstrong. Tejada goes back safely. Landed Stevens in the on-deck circle for the Red Hawks. Steven Krause in the hole should we get there as the count is 0-1-1 with one out against Will Vogelsang. Tejada. Still a sizable lead off of first base. Armstrong using his peripheral to look over there and now comes home. And that's chopped towards shortstop. Play made by Lang over to second for one. On to first and he is safe. Will Vogelsang showing the speed, getting the fielder's choice. Tejada out at second. Now two outs in the inning for Landon Stevens. Unsuccessful double play attempt here by Purdue Fort Wayne, but still great anticipation by Jack Lang to get that ball over to second, but no throw made by Aaron Chapman. 
The Red Hawks able to stay alive as the always dangerous Landon Stevens in the right side. A nice righty ready matchup here for the senior. Armstrong comes home, first pitch, drops low, right near the ankles, 1 0. Stevens last year started 56 games for the Red Hawks. Always been that go-to guy. As Will Vogel saying now goes for second base, and the pitch skips up on Dylan Stewart. Goes up against the backstop. Easy play for Will Vogel saying as he moves up to second, and it's 2-0 on Stevens. And the Macedons were prepped for that anyway. Aaron Chapman, the second baseman, was playing probably about four steps to the left of the second base bag. Not even a throw attempt for him to corral, though, so Will Vogel saying slides in safely. Will Vogel saying will be credited with the steal. He's now one for two. Was caught stealing yesterday. Part of the always aggressive base running style of this Miami team and a style of play that Danny Hayden loves. 2-0 is now 3-0. Fastball high and away. 79 that time on the gun. Not a lot of velocity here from Armstrong. Stevens in general, very good discipline at the plate. Already has a couple of walks this season as Wolf Ogosang, a nice lead off of second base, about seven steps. Takes a step back towards the bag, and the pitch comes home. A nice breaking ball, 70 that time, gets Stevens out front, and it's 3-1. and one. He wanted that when he took a big cut at it, trying to follow up on his teammates, Ogosang and Andrews, putting a ball over the left field wall. It's especially juicy, too, when you have somebody who's not really throwing that hard to you either or just in the high 70s, and that pitch was there was at 70 miles an hour. Red Hawks five runs on three hits. 3-1 three pitch comes home to Stevens, and he already started to take off for first base as he knew that pitch was missing low and away, and the Red Hawks have runners on first and second and two outs for Steven Kraus. Krause was hit by Tyler Kissinger back in the first. Again, went one for two yesterday with a home run. Walked twice. You know, and last year it was Andrews who took a lot of that DH role, and I think now with Krause at just a redshirt freshman going to reclaim that role and has plenty of time to, to lock down that spot. First pitch to Kraus misses high. One ball, no strikes. Still two outs, bottom of the second. Red Hawks lead 5-4 to four here at McKee Field at Hayden Park. Sizable crowd here today, probably 200 people. Not bad for a Sunday afternoon. Fairly cold, too. Again, around 45 degrees. Wind moving 10 to 15 miles an hour from home plate, more into the left center gap. Kraus gripping the bat. Armstrong looking back towards Vogel, saying at second pitch misses or rather gets the inside edge, a breaking pitch, late break too. Got the nice frame also from Dylan Stewart behind the plate, and it's one and one. Armstrong look back, Vogel saying double steal put on. Throw towards second, Stevens slides in safely. A very risky move put on by Danny Hayden, a double steal. But then again, it pays off. Now you have two runners in scoring position and a 2-1 count with Kraus. Yeah, you're four-hole hitter, so very risky move by Danny Hayden, but this could pay dividends if Kraus puts one in the outfield. Really anything will drive home one and maybe even two. Stevens still has a little bit of speed on the bases. Stole two bags yesterday. Two balls in a strike. Armstrong a deep breath. Andy now comes home. Kraus fouls it off right behind home plate into the netting. Should we get there? Charlie Harrigan in the on-deck circle again. Will Vogel saying at third, landed Stevens at second. 
Parker Massman led things off in this inning, flew out into right field. Christian Tejada then walked, then was thrown out after Will Vogel sang hit into a 6-4 fielder's choice. And landed Stevens walking and then moving up to second on that double steal as the 2-2 is grounded towards shortstop, picked up by Jack Lang, hurls it across, and he pulls the first baseman, Travis, up off the bag, and the Red Hawks have put up another one here in the bottom of the second, and they lead 6-4. That's a hard throw for Lang. He's going into the hole between him and the third baseman, and he's got to make the long throw across the diamond with Landon Stevens, the runner going from second to third, running in front of him. So tough play, and the Red Hawks get a run as a result. So now Charlie Harrigan stepping into left side. Righty-lefty matchup coming up. Singled in the first, scored on the home run from Cole Andrews. As that is officially will be counted as an error for Lang at short. Stewart setting up on the outside part of the play, an early release as that pitch misses high from Armstrong, 1-0. Two outs here, bottom of the second, 6-4 to four in favor of the Red Hawks. Landed Stevens at third, Steven Krause at first. Everybody at fairly normal depth in terms of the infield for the Mastodons. Now the junior comes set on the mound, comes home. Breaking pitch, 67, misses well outside. That would have hit a righty batter. But instead, it's the lefty Harrigan. It's 2-0. Oh. He's got a breaking ball like your fastball, Ben, it was. Oh, yeah. Top out, I top out at about 68. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you were a pitcher, though, in high school, weren't you? Yeah, I hit about 78, 80, and I was done, it's which not, was good gas yeah. in high school. Oh, yeah. But I haven't grown since then, so <laughs> I'm still around the same mark. Not exactly going to get you to play at Miami. So it was chopped foul down the first baseline. Skips up into the Mastodon dugout, 2-1. and one. But still, you're a bigger guy. What, 6'2", six 6'3"? Six About 6'1". Oh, wow, way off. I know, I can't give myself that much. <laughs> still, you got a bigger frame. That makes sense while you're throwing up near 80. I could go back in the day, Bennett Wise. <laughs> Don't you doubt that. 2-1, hits Harrigan on the elbow, and now the bases are loaded. A great extended inning for the Red Hawks. Thought it was definitely going to be over after the Vogel saying at bat, but then Landon Stevens draws a walk, an error committed by the Mastodons, put Stephen Krause on the bases, and now a hit by a pitch for Harrigan. And Cole Andrews, who already homered once, has the bases loaded here with two outs. Stevens at third, Krause at second, Harrigan at first. Red Hawks continue to lead six to four on just three hits. IPW has four hits, one error committed by both of these teams as the first pitch to Andrews comes home. He rips it through the left side of the infield and that'll score one and maybe two. Krause being sent home by Danny Hayden. Throw coming home, won't get there as it's cut off. And the Red Hawks scoring two, eight to four in favor of Miami. Have yourself a day already. Cole Andrews, five RBIs just on that two-run single and the three-run home run in the first. That brings up Tyler Wardwell. He's a switch hitter. Going to go on the left side here against the righty Armstrong. Harrigan at second. Cole Andrews at first. Macedon's trying to get out of this inning. Five runs put up by the Red Hawks. In the first, now three here in the second. First pitch right down the middle with a fastball at 77-0-1. Got action in the Macedon's bullpen again. Looks like senior righty Owen Pyatt is up. Wardwell waving the bat around with his right hand, catching it in his left. Now puts it over his left shoulder, waves it around a little bit. Left, excuse me, leaves it on his right shoulder as the pitch comes home, swinging and missing on a breaking pitch. Trying to go for reaching for it, and it's 0-2 with two outs. Wardwell flew out into shallow left center field in his first plate appearance. 
Now two for 19 to start his Red Hawk career. Played two years at Duke, but returns home from since he went to LaSalle High School, as Chris mentioned earlier, as the 0-2 drops in front of Dylan Stewart, and it rolls slightly up the first baseline. Both runners will advance, so runners in scoring position again for the Red Hawks with two outs. Now, if you're Wardwell, you choke up just a little bit and try to line one in a left field. Could score two more for the Red Hawks. If they were able to push this, their run total into double digits already in the second inning, that could be a devastating blow. Infield now pushed back for the Mastodons. They were encroached in with runners. And on first and second, now second and third as Wardwell waits for a pitch, and it's two and two. That one missed high and inside on the lefty. Orwell also looking for his first extra base hit. Has only has two singles. Does have a pair of RBIs. As Armstrong, a large deep breath. Now kicks in, fires home. 2-2, grounded towards shortstop. Easy play for Lang. Sends it over to first for out number three as the Mastodons give up three runs here against the Red Hawks as Miami leads 8-4 as we move to the top of the third here on Red Hawk Radio. Top three in the Red Hawks already going to the bullpen, so Kenton Egbert is done after two innings. And Logan Schmidt, the junior out of Bolingbrook, Illinois, replaces him. He is a righty as he gets one, a ground ball towards Wardwell at short. He picks it up, hurls it across, and it is caught by Harrigan for out number one. This is the second appearance of the season for Logan Schmidt. First one came back on February 15th at A&M. Pitch two innings, three strikeouts, no hits or runs allowed. This guy didn't play much his first two years with Danny Hayden as he now faces Alex Evenson, who takes the first pitch all the way for a strike at 84. Evenson doubled back in the first, was stranded at third. It's the junior from Minnetonka, Minnesota, awaits the second pitch, and it's a fastball missing in right near the knees. It's one and one. 
So Egbert is done after two innings, 45 total pitches, four hits allowed, three earned runs, four runs total. As the 1-0 from Smith is a ball that misses just below the knees, 2-1. Egbert did have one walk, two strikeouts, and 11 batters faced. But Danny Hayden electing to go to the bullpen after experience showing for Kenton Egbert. And swinging and missing on the 2-1 is Alex Evenson in the designated hitting spot. Even ups the count at 2-2. Two two. Evenson went 2-4 for four yesterday with an RBI. Was in that designated hitting spot. And now Schmidt, the 2-2, tries to go for a fastball at 92, missing high and away, and it puts the count full. No shift for the Red Hawks, but middle of the infield playing back. Will Vogel sang in shallow right center field. This one is ripped down the right field line, but it lands foul about six feet from that chalk. Could have been trouble as Aaron Chapman to lead things off. Hug that line. Able to get all the way over to third to lead things off in this ball game. And now the payoff from Schmidt. Another foul ball. Hide Chopper down the first baseline. And it rolls back into play. And a Purdue Fort Wayne Mastodon will have to come out and snag that one from right field. Now the 3 2 again. Another. It's pretty much same result. The Mastodon that was going out to get that ball let it roll right back in front of him. Three balls, two strikes, one out in the top of the third. Miami putting up five runs in the third, three in the second. The Mastodons of Purdue Fort Wayne, two in the first, two in the second, trying to cut into this four run deficit. 3 2 by Schmidt, swing and a miss. Evanson will be sat down. First strike out of the afternoon for Logan Schmidt in relief. That brings up Garrett Muller. So two easy outs so far for Logan Schmidt. And Chris, he's one of these guys, didn't play too much his first two years, but somebody that Danny Hayden really likes. Yeah, and he's another guy. I mentioned Grant Hartwig earlier. He's another guy who could slide into that Shane Smith role where he can eat up multiple innings no matter the time of game. And he's got really good stuff. First pitch was fouled off behind home plate. Same result, but it is stopped by the chest protector of Cole Andrews and quickly 0-2. Again, two outs here in the top of the third. Ground out to short by Garrett Lake and then that strikeout by Alex Evenson. 0-2 comes home, drops the dirt, drop third strike, but no, the home plate umpire Chuck Adya won't give him the chance to run down to first, so a 1-2-3 inning with two strikeouts by Logan Schmidt in relief. Can't get more efficient than that as we move now to the bottom of the third. Miami still up 8-4 here on the Mastodons of Purdue Fort Wayne on Red Hawk Radio.
Bottom three from Hayden Park. To my left is Chris Minnell. I'm Bennett Wise. And right now it has been all Red Hawks. Five runs in the first, three in the second. And Logan Schmidt coming in relief for the Red Hawks, going three up, three down in the top half of the inning. And a new pitcher is Owen Pyatt, and he plunks Brian Zapp on his first pitch. Yeah, Pyatt's a guy who's entered two ball games already this year, but has only gotten three outs, given up four runs, only one earned. But the Macedons are going to look for him to eat up innings today with, with seven to go. And, you know, they've already given up eight runs, so they need some stability out there on the mound. Yeah, still trying to find that answer. Trevor Armstrong only lasts an inning. The same with Tyler Kissinger, both facing eight Red Hawk batters, both going one inning, but Armstrong allowing one hit, three runs. None of them were earned. Two walks, no strikeouts. So they continue to go with a right Ian Owen Pyatt, who comes with a breaking ball at 74, getting the right side of the plate here against the righty Parker Massman. Massman's a guy who really wants to have a bounce back year. Had an outstanding freshman season two years ago and then struggled for a large part of last season. He only hit 211. But he did start 37 games, appeared in 42 for Danny Hayden's club. So he awaits the 0-1. Another breaking pitch on the outer half for a strike. Massman didn't even take a bat off a shoulder. No balls, two strikes, nobody out. Bottom of the third, Brian Zapp sits at first base after being hit on the first pitch by Owen Pyatt, the third Mastodon pitcher here today. 0-2 comes home, check swing, strike three, and Parker Massman now 0 for 2 in this ball game. First time he struck out today. That brings up the top of the order, Christian Tejada for Miami. He works with one out and would runner on first. Would not be surprised, Chris, would you, if you saw the run here? I would not be, knowing Danny Hayden. He likes to move runners over any way he can get it. Stolen base, bunt. Still just four hits for Miami as Christian Tejada watches that one go all the way into the glove of Dylan Stewart for a strike. 87 on the fastball right down the middle. Then again, Tejada really hasn't gotten the chance to hit today with a hit by pitch and a walk. I'm sure he's chomping at the bit to just swing the bat. He just wants to get a hit, too. He went 0 for 5 with two strikeouts yesterday. Finally takes the bat off his shoulder, and it's fouled off. That'll probably end up in the parking lot. Did you park near the uh, – out there in the, in the foul ball territory? No, thank God. <laughs> so off to the right here of Hayden Park is a massive parking lot. The one that houses most people that go to the Farmer School of Business, the psychology building, or really just anywhere towards the middle of campus here at Miami University. And there are signs that say, caution, foul walls. So people are warned as the O2 sells well high over the head of Tejada. One ball, two strikes, still one out. I guess it's just the risk you take and the price you pay to have a baseball stadium right in the middle of this beautiful campus. And it, is an, it is a unique feature. There's just a couple of dorms here, Hepburn Hall, President's Hall, the fairly new building just built last year, McFarland Hall right here too, and the Miami Inn all overlook this field. As now Zapp retreats back to first. One ball, two strikes, one out, bottom of the third. Miami leads it eight to four. Four hits for both these clubs in addition to one error. Now Tejada staring into the eyes of Pyatt. He comes home, right back to him, reaches out, makes the throw to second. It goes off the glove of Jack Lang. Runners will be safe at first and second. Nearly a double play turn. Could have been disaster for Miami, but again, a lucky break here for the Red Hawks. Absolutely great play by Pyatt. That's one of those where you don't even look up, really, and you just find the ball in your glove, just acting completely on instinct. Turns around, makes a solid throw to second base, but... Unable to corral it were the Macedons. It's not going to be the second error committed by Lang today in just the third inning. It's already having a tough day defensively. Now we move to Will Vogel saying. Reached out a fielder's choice in the second. Has scored both times he's come to the plate via a two-run home run in the first. And then two stolen bases, one being a double steal with two outs. So aggressive base running again, a theme here today for Miami as Vogel saying watches the first pitch go on the outside edge for a strike, 0-1.
Teada at first, Brian Zapp at second. Macedon's at double play depth as Zapp with the hot feet moving back and forth towards second and third base as Vogelsang watches another pitch drop in the middle of the zone. It's 0-2. Here comes the sun a little bit. Still cloudy skies here in Oxford. Warming up a little bit. I can feel my toes now. <laughs> I'm still trying to find mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, two here on Vogel saying choking up a decent amount. Trying to get aggressive here with runners on first and second pitch from Pyatt goes well wide of Stewart. Both runners will advance here on a wild pitch. And runners in scoring position for Will Vogel, saying part of that just aggressive style that Danny Hayden loves, and then also Will Vogel saying just being the guy that he is can really uh, bring to the table. Now the Mastodon's preparing for the bunt. Everybody lining the infield grass about a foot in front of their respective bags. Nobody covering second or third base. Garrett Muller about five feet away from third base as that pitch, an early release missing well high of Vogel saying it's two and two. Vogel saying still choking up on the bat, his right hand, so that's his top hand at the top of the batting tape as another pitch goes high of Stewart and then lucky that it bounced all the way back off off the backstop and right back into his glove so no runners will advance for Miami. Pilot looked okay on his first couple of batters but here against Vogelsang just struggling to hold on to the ball and get it where he wants it to go. It looks like he's almost trying to overthrow put a little bit too much power on the ball. Especially with his breaking ball we've seen a couple of breaking balls get away from him. Three balls, two strikes, one out, bottom of the third. Brian Zapp at second, or excuse me, at third base now. Tejada at second. And with one out, the payoff pitch comes home. Vogelsang takes it all the way, and he will walk to first. Bases are now loaded, and this could be trouble for Purdue Fort Wayne with the heart of the lineup coming up. Landon Stevens has yet to put a ball in play today. He struck out in his first plate, plate appearance and then last time around walked. So he's really looking to get off the bat off his shoulders and join the rest of his teammates. I mean, they put up eight runs. I'm sure their three-hole hitter would love to get in on that as well. Came into today eight for 19 at the plate, three for five yesterday, came around to score three times. Also swiped two pillows yesterday as he now takes time and readjusts his batting gloves. Base is loaded. First pitch to Stevens. Fastball at 87 on the outer half of the plate for a strike. Brian Zapp at third. Christian Tejada at second. Will Vogel saying at first. Corners the infield playing in for Purdue Fort Wayne as the 0 1 skips up over the plate and it's 1 and 1. Middle infield slightly pushed back. That's Aaron Chapman at second and Jack Lang at short. Lang already two errors through three innings. Mastodon's trying to prevent Miami from extending out this lead. They currently lead eight to four. As a fastball at 86 misses high and away. Two balls and a strike on Stevens. Part of that last inning for Miami. Three runs only on one hit. That was a two-run single by Cole Andrews. Capitalizing on an error from Purdue Fort Wayne as the 2-1 missing low and away on a curveball. And it puts the count at 3-1. and one. It was pretty much yesterday, Chris. This entire middle part of the lineup that accounted for all of their offense, Parker Massman 
able to get a hit yesterday. He was really the only one outside of that middle part of the order that didn't get a hit as now Landon Stevens swings on and misses. And this puts the count full at three and two with one out. Today it's been a little bit of everyone besides uh, really Landon Stevens and Steven Kraus. Both will get going eventually, if not this at bat. Now the 3-2, well high, and that will be an RBI walk for Landon Stevens. Red Hawks will lead 9-4 as Brian Zapp with a nice stroll home. And now a mound visit and probably a pitching change for Purdue-Fort Wayne, and there is the signal. So we will get you more information on that new pitcher and the rest of this ball game as we are still in the bottom of the third, Miami leading 9-4 here on Red Hawk Radio. So the pitching change again for the Mastodons after just a third of an inning. Oh, Pyatt relieves the game, and he has relieved Chris by Justin Miller. Yeah, Miller's a sophomore left-hander. He pitched once already this year against Longwood. It was a start, actually, and he went three and a third, gave up five runs, four earned. Did strike out eight guys in those three innings, though, so he's a guy who's really going to look to get the ball past the Red Hawks. Lefty-righty matchup here as Steven Krause takes the first pitch, a fastball that drops right near the ankles. That's 0-1. Red Hawks half the bases loaded. Landon Stevens at first. Will Vogel saying at second. Christian Tejada at third. So a lot of speed on the bases. So anything into the gaps could potentially clear the bases. Miller now the 1-0. He kicks and deals. Kraus gets a piece of it into the Miami dugout. Hot soup. Hot soup, Chris Fennell. Cole Gannett was the guy who uh, brought that to Oxford. Apparently, they say at any time anything is hit hard at the dugout or really uh, Cole Gannett's by the end of his tenure here, by the end of his career, he'd use it just about any time. It's a great saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I asked Ross Haffey, two years ago, I asked Ross Haffey, the all-star first baseman for the Red Hawks, what that meant. He's like, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> like, no one has any idea what it means, but Cole Gannett's loved saying it. That was a change up on the inner part of the plate. Red Hawk faithful here don't like it, and neither did Steven Krause as he looked back to Chuck Adya, the home plate umpire. It's one and two here against the redshirt freshman. Trying to generate more runs here for the Red Hawks as they lead nine to four, just four hits for Miami. Taking advantage of some walks and a couple of errors committed by the Mastodons. 
Justin Miller now steps off. He'll take a second and regroup, cycle back through the signs. He stands at 5'9", 180 pounds, sophomore out of Roanoke, Indiana. He now comes set, a nice leg kick, and the one-two. Grounded through the left side of the infield, and that'll score one and maybe more. Danny Hayden sending home Will Vogel, saying he loses the lid in the process and slides home safely, and Red Hawks now lead 11-4. One of my favorite things about Will Vogel saying is every time he runs the bases, his helmet's coming off. I mean, I don't know if it's the speed that he has or he's just running that hard, but his helmet comes off every time as it did there at rounding third. That brings home Tejada and then Vogel saying, as we just mentioned, runners now on first and second. That's Steven Krause at first. Landon Stevens occupies the second base bag, and that'll bring up Charlie Harrigan for a lefty-lefty matchup here with Justin Miller. Mastodon's at double play depth. Cole Andrews standing in the on-deck circle as Charlie Harrigan, one for one today, was also hit by a pitch in his last plate appearance, checks his swing, and he did go around, so that's strike number one. Harrigan, a senior out of LaGrange, Illinois. Five for 12 coming into this ball game. Again, added that single, also scored a run. Has one extra base hit. That was a triple, but an RBI machine has four already to start the year. Had 29 last year. That was fourth on the team. And he takes another strike that time, a breaking pitch, and right down the middle, 73, and it's 0-2. Landon Stevens has his hands on his knees at second. Steven Krause standing upright, nobody covering first base. And now Harrigan will step out of that left side, batter's box and regroup. Quick look back to second by Miller. He now comes home, a fastball drops to the feet of the catcher, Stewart, it's one and two. One ball, two strikes, one out in the bottom of the third. Miami putting up three runs here in this bottom half of the inning. They lead 11-4. to four. Now the 1-2 comes home, breaking pitch, grounder toward third on one knee was Muller. He throws to second for one, no throw to first. And an easy play for Landon Stevens. Nobody covering third base. So now runners on the corners and two outs. Aragon moves to first, Landon Stevens at third for Cole Andrews, who five RBIs through three innings, or rather through two innings, three via a home run in the first and two from a single in the second. Still just five hits for the Red Hawks. Again, 11 runs. Now the first pitch, breaking ball, 76. Getting the inner half at the plate, and it's 0-1. This offense really hasn't even changed that much from last year either. The only people they lost was McKay Williams, who was a 301 hitter for Miami as Cole Andrews taps this one foul right beyond the Miami dugout. Another guy they had to replace was Colin Shepard. He was a transfer. He now is out of the Miami program. Landon Stevens now stealing home, but the throw to home plate is caught, and the tag applied by Stewart. I mean, Justin Miller nearly got caught napping. Stevens just said, you know what, I'm just going to go. But it unfortunately does not pay off for Miami, but it doesn't matter because they put up three runs here in the bottom of the third as we move to the top half of the fourth. Miami leading this one 11-4 here on Red Hawk Radio.
Welcome back to McKee Field at Hayden Park. I'm Chris Vanell taking over for the uber talented Bennett Wise. As the first batter, Robert Young, the third, pops out to the third baseman, Brian Zapp. We've got one down here in the top of the fourth inning. Logan Schmidt still on the mound. He worked the last inning for Miami. Only threw 15 pitches, 12 strikes coming right at guys, and he looks to do the same here. Lucas Kolovitz, the batter. First pitch to him goes wide a ball. Kolovitz, in his only plate appearance so far, he walked. Schmitz kicks and deals. That's a swinging strike off the outside corner. Evens the count out one and one. Schmidt's a guy who didn't pitch much in his first two years at Miami, now really looking to establish himself as he delivers again. This is another swinging strike. This one fouled off towards the third base line. Just a little tapper. Kolovitz quickly down one and two. Miami's had an all-around game. They used the power, hit a couple of bombs, and we've seen some stolen bases here. They've jumped out to an 11-4 lead as Schmitz kicks and deals. This is another foul ball. It's another tapper towards the Miami dugout. Kolovitz staying alive for another opportunity. Schmitz really using that fastball to come in on guys. He readies on the mound, working quickly. There's another swinging strike, just gets a piece of it, does Kolovitz. A little bit of a battle brewing here between him and the pitcher, Logan Schmitz. Schmitz winds and deals. This one's in the dirt, but he gets a swing and a miss. Throw on down to first base, and Kolovitz is retired for out number two. So two quick outs here. First pitch swinging was Robert Young, and then Schmitz gets a strikeout on Kolovitz. He is starting to find his game, and he's finding his game here today. As Travis up the batter, he grounds one foul down the first base line. One and two, the count now. Up, going to take a moment to tie his shoe. He'll step slowly back in the box. Schmidt's ready on the mound. He's ready to go. He'll actually step off now, take a quick breather. It was batter and pitcher ready. It's good to see that fast pace from Schmidt, too, getting in, getting out. Absolutely. As this ball makes it through the hole between the shortstop and the third baseman and in the left field, that's a base hit for Travis up. And even though it comes with two outs, the Mastodon has have a little bit of life here in the top of the fourth. Still just the first hit allowed by... Logan Schmidt already has three strikeouts. I don't think that's really going to do too much to him. Uh, I would expect him here to come back out, still continue to be aggressive. It probably go at least another couple innings before they head to the bullpen again. And the crazy thing is, as Dylan Stewart steps in the box, the catcher, crazy thing is these teams both have five hits apiece. Very different numbers on the scoreboard, though. Miami 11, Purdue Fort Wayne just four. First pitch to Stewart is in there for a called strike. And that's ultimately what a lot of college baseball comes down to is taking advantage of kind of little mistakes, and that's been a real big factor for Danny Hayden's club the last couple of years. The self-proclaimed good guys. Yes, sir. Second pitch is just off the inside corner. Schmitz came with a fastball at 83 miles an hour but wasn't able to hook the corner. See, even just looking at Schmitz before he comes set, he's like fiddling with his fingers a little bit. He's just itching. He's ready to go. Here's another pitch. He's grounded right back to him, and reflexes kick in. He corrals it and just flips on to first base. The side is retired, and we'll take a quick break here on Red Hawk Radio. Miami leads 11-4 as we head to the bottom of the fourth.
We've got some continuity on the mound for Purdue Fort Wayne. Justin Miller, the left-hander, is back out there for almost his second inning of work. Pitched two-thirds in the last frame. He's going to start out against Cole Andrews, who's behind the dish for Miami today. Cole, so far, he hit a home run in the first inning that really jumped Miami out to the lead as he takes a breaking ball in there for a called strike. Counts it's at 0-1. Andrews, one of the few Red Hawks who's not wearing any like sort of Under Armour or anything to guard those arms. That's kind of bold too. You don't really see that a lot from really anybody. He's not. It doesn't look like he's even wearing an ankle protector on that front foot. He's That's, a ball player. Oh yeah, total ball player move. <laughs> one and one, the count now. Here's the pitch, and it's in there for another called strike. 86 miles an hour. Miller comes with the fastball in the inner third. Andrews steps out for a hot second. Looks down to Danny Hayden. His head coach and third base coach steps back in, calls time. Here comes the pitch from Miller. That's a breaking ball upstairs and away, 77 miles per hour. So we had Schmitz working quickly for the Red Hawks and now for the Macedons. Miller moving pretty fast on the mound too. He's set, and he will go from the full windup. That one just misses. Risky pitch to be taking up and away. 87 mile an hour fastball with two strikes, but it runs the count full. Yeah, he was trying to go at least extend that into right field, go for the little oppo taco hit. Andrews got power to all fields, looking to display it here with a full count. He swings on this one and drives it into the parking lot down the right field line and out of play. Looking to straighten that one out as he got a pretty good pop on that hit. He's back in, standing very close to that plate, really crowding it, making Miller come after him. Miller looks to do so here as he kicks and deals. Here's a drive back into right field. This one will be taken care of by the right fielder, and Cole Andrews is retired. Yeah, was it just an easy play again, trying to extend his hands out, drive it the other way. Seen a lot of it, uh, especially when there's kind of these cold conditions. And, of course, the sun keeps coming in and out, and it's not out right now. But still, with that wind pushing out towards center field, it's going to lift it a little bit more. So even it's even better if you're trying to go opposite field because uh, you can get that extra bit from the wind. Andrews hit the ball well, but Kolovitz, the right fielder, was able to range over and take care of the liner. Now Tyler Wardwell, the batter, the switch hitter. We saw him from the left side in his first two plate appearances, now going to the right side against the lefty Miller. 0-1, oh he falls behind. There's one out here in the inning. Red Hawks still lead 11-4. Here's the second pitch to Wardwell. It's in there for a college strike, painting the black of the inside corner. Wardwell, a guy who was highly recruited out of high school. He's a local boy, just from... About an hour away, even less so, Cincinnati. Here's the 0-2 to him. He grounds this one softly towards the Miami dugout. And will stay alive with two strikes. So far today, he popped out and grounded out both times to the shortstop. So looking to kind of get away from that six hole. Miller kicks in deals. Big bender and... Wardwell is called out on strikes. He can't draw it up any better than that as he starts it up above the zone and rolls it right back in, 81 miles an hour. Yeah, it was just a nice pitch. A little bit of a change up trying to get him out there reaching. Of course he did. And now two outs. You know, starting to find a groove here. It seems like Justin Miller just kind of finding the answer to, to these Red Hawks again because you know it's, they were struggling before. Owen Pyatt only goes a third of an inning, couldn't really get anybody out. It seems like this lefty has the Red Hawks figured out, and there you go. And here's a line drive by Brian Zapp, the next batter in the right field. He'll take a turn at first base, but will ultimately stay put. Miller, that's the first lefty he has faced this inning. Faced Charlie Harrigan last half inning and got a fielder's choice. Yeah, it's good to see Brian Zapp also getting another hit. That's just his second hit now in his Miami career, freshman from uh, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. So... Yeah, I think this cold, I'm pretty sure he's probably used to it, so not that big of a deal for him. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's good to see uh, some of these newer guys getting going. 
Parker Massman, the batter now, who has ultimately been held without a hit as well. He takes a called strike on the inner third. 88 miles an hour, the fastball from Miller. Massman, once again, again uh, just another guy who consistency is his biggest thing. He shows flashes of being one of the better players on this Miami team, going all the way back to his freshman year two years ago. But a struggle to just find some stability, find some continuity. Second pitch to him is bouncing the dirt. It gets away from the catcher, and Zapp will take second base. Yeah, it just seems like a lot of inconsistency with these Mastodon pitchers. It seems like especially when they go to a lot of their off-speed pitches, they either come out too early or they overthrow, which causes them to either hit the dirt or on those early releases they come out a little bit too high. We saw a lot of high pitches, especially uh, from, from Trevor Armstrong in the second inning. And, you know, it's tough, too. It's it's early in the season. You know, it's just your second series, a lot of second appearances for these guys. So it's, it takes a while to find your groove. Miller working from the stretch. He will deliver. This is a fastball high. Once again, almost gets away from the catcher. Dylan Stewart's earning his money back there today. Sure is. I tell you what, being a catcher is not easy. It's probably, I would say, one of the hardest jobs in baseball. I mean, imagine that. You got to take pitch after pitch. Some of the, I mean, sometimes you guys guys throwing 95 at you. Sometimes it's 60, and you have to anticipate it all. Go with the movements. It's tough. Another good job by him there as he blocks one in the dirt. Three and one the count now on Parker Massman. Even kind of the mental side of being a catcher, you have to remember all the signs. You got to remember what every what your different pitchers throw, and I'm sure you know. Obviously, I've, you know, they you get reminded of what each pitcher throws when they come in. But still, it's it's a lot of work to be a catcher. Physical and mental grind for sure. He's back squatting behind the plate. Massman steps in, and Miller looks in for the sign. Stewart will give it to him. Massman bat on the shoulder. He'll pick it back up now as Miller sets. The three-one pitch. That one is almost in the dirt as well. Too low, and Massman will trot on down to first base after taking off his elbow brace. Again, just a lot of patience here by the Red Hawks in general. You know, a lot of walks here already, a couple of hit by pitches. It's good to just see a lot of plate discipline. And this is a more experienced team now. A lot of juniors and seniors who a couple years ago, they probably would have taken a lot of these pitches that would have been low and away. So it's good to see some experience showing and, and these guys waiting back a little bit. So Christian Tejada, is the bat Christian Tejada is the batter now. He's reached base in all three of his plate appearances but does not have a hit on the afternoon. This one he skies into shallow left field near the foul line. Shortstop is going to range over. He'll take care of it in foul territory, and this inning is over. So we head to the top of the fifth. Miami leading 11-4 to after not getting another run in this half inning. We're on Red Hawk Radio. Catch you back in a minute. Chris Vanell back alongside Bennett Wise, my partner, my buddy. We're broadcasting Miami baseball. They lead 11-4 to over the Port, the Purdue-Fort Wayne Macedons. Easy for me to say, right? It's a fairly long name. It's not the <laughs> easiest. I mean, isn't their full official name Indiana Purdue-Fort Wayne? Yes. That's a mouthful. Yeah, so it's a mouthful as Logan Schmidt is back out there for his third inning of work through two innings that he's already thrown. He's only thrown 28 pitches, given up one hit, struck out three, and no walks. 
I'd love to see his strike to ball ratio right now. It has to be high in favor of strikes. He's just locked in. And he, you know, he's working as we were just talking about during the break, during his warm up pitches. He was cycling through them. He wants to just keep going. And it seems like that competitive atmosphere is just really working for him. He's going at it here early, but has not been able to get the better of Aaron Chapman, who's worked a 3 0 count. Here's a 3 0 to him. He's taken all the way, and he'll take ball four. You know, for a guy who also hasn't necessarily pitched a bunch over the last couple of years, a walk like that, a four-pitch walk, I, I, I understand why it's happening. But, you know, you're going to make a mistake every now and then. So I think for in the case of Logan Schmidt right now, you know, two innings, you know, you're at 32 pitches already. It can be a lot, especially when you haven't thrown that much. But I would still expect him to, to get out of this inning. Absolutely. His first pitch to Jack Lang, the shortstop, is wide. Schmitz drops his hands down to the belt. He'll check on the runner at first and will now deliver. This one has popped up towards the right side of the infield. Will Vogelsang is going to sit under it. He'll take care of it for out number one, and the runner stays at first base. Again, that's just a nice pitch. Got it high enough, but still has that little bit of movement. Able to catch at the time Jack Lang off guard. Still one away, got plenty of room to work with. You're getting a ground ball here, turn the double play, and you're already out of the inning. Aaron Chapman does have good speed at first base, one for one on the year in stolen bases. First pitch to Garrett Lake, the three-hole hitter, is fouled back into the catcher's mitt, four strike one. Oh, and one the count now to Lake. Both batter and pitcher are ready. Schmitz kicks and deals. That one is lined right back up the middle, a solid base hit. And the Macedons have something working here with just one out. Game of baseball just can be really, really weird sometimes. It just the ebbs and flows of the game. I mean, the fact that Miami put up 5 3 and 3 in their first three innings in Purdue. Fort Wayne puts up two, two, and now a couple of zeros, and they want to start battling back. We saw it, too, a, a little bit in, the, in game one. You know, they didn't score their first two runs uh, in that final ball game. That was six to two. They didn't score their two runs until the eighth inning. You know, and, and so the offense can come at really any bit of time and any sort of momentum. You just got to take it and run with it, and that's what Purdue Fort Wayne's doing. Alex Evanson, the four-hole hitter, steps in and fouls one immediately off to his right side. 0-1 oh, the count now. A very good opportunity for Purdue-Fort Wayne. Two runners on, one out, and the cleanup hitter at the plate. Logan Schmidt working in his third inning, so not a super long time, but still, for a reliever, he's getting up there. And he delivers a called strike, a breaking ball, down in the zone at the knees. Definitely where you want to live if you're Logan Schmidt. The Rocks do have a little bit of action. I think that's the righty Michael Spinozzi. So should any more trouble happen for Schmidt, we do have that righty up and going. The 0-2 from Schmidt, swing and a miss. He came with the fastball at 88 and sits down Evanson. That's a huge out for Logan Schmidt. Yeah, again, just trying to find back your groove. Again, now two outs on the board. He got runners on first and second. You can make a play at any base. Again, it takes the pressure off you a little bit, even if you get something in play. And that's something, too, with uh, an inexperienced pitcher. They always try to pitch around the batter and not pitch to him because they want to avoid any sort of contact. But it looks like Logan Schmidt's trying to avoid that altogether. First pitch to Garrett Moeller is outside. He came with a fastball and just missed off the plate away. Moeller 0 for 2 on the day with a ground out and a strikeout. A lot of these guys for the Macedons coming around for their third time to bat. We've seen the Red Hawks probably four or five times each as this one is fouled off towards the left side. Well, it drops fair. They're actually going to call it in play as that one hits just in the corner. And two runs are going to score, so a huge play for the Macedons. They're tacking on to their just a little bit, shortening their deficit, 11-6 now with two outs. 
Yeah, that was going to be a really tough play. The wind carrying it out. And again, the wind's moving from home plate towards left center field. So again, kind of guiding that ball a little bit towards the left side. That actually hit off the numbers of 332 out there, about five feet away from that foul line. Oh, not so, even. Yeah, I, I would look down break. at my scorebook for a second with the way everyone reacted. They looked like a sure fire foul ball. Unfortunately for the Red Hawks, no way. Two run double for Garrett Moeller. Robert Young the third steps in. He takes a called strike right on the inside corner to start him out. Young, another guy who's 0 for 2 at the moment. Popped out to the third baseman and struck out. Young really crouched over stance. Schmidt working from the stretch, delivers again, and comes right at him with that fastball. This one down and away in the strike zone. 85 miles an hour. Yeah, now that Macedon just put up two runs, going with a different pitcher now warming up, and it's your boy Grant Hartwig. You know, they sit down Spinozzi. They probably, since he hasn't played that much, and he's a transfer coming in here to Miami. Now it's been a little bit of a closer game. Go with a guy who has a little bit more experience. The third pitch to Young is off the plate away. One and two to the count now. You know, it's a nice little wake-up call for Miami, the two runs, saying, hey, this Keep one trying. isn't clinched down yet. Yep. you got to keep working, and we've got half a ball game left. So Sure thing. 11-6 to six is the Miami lead at the moment. Logan Schmitz on the mound delivering to Robert Young the third. This one is lined in the right field. Landon Stevens going back. He's going to range over and take care of it, though, near the warning track, and the side is retired. So we're going to go to the bottom half of the fifth inning. Miami leads 11-6. to six. You're listening to Red Hawk Radio. Back here in Oxford with Miami baseball. The Red Hawks lead 11 to 6 here in the bottom of the fifth inning. We found some stability on the mound, too. Justin Miller for the Macedons is in his third inning of work. Logan Schmitz for Miami just completed his third inning as Will Vogel sang the batter. Squares to bunt. He'll pull it back as the ball is way above the plate. Ball one. Another breaking ball. We've seen plenty of these today that breaking balls that just won't break, they stay way far above the zone. Part of that's finding your groove as a pitcher, too. It's tough early in the season, especially with these conditions. Suns keep coming in and out. It gets hot. It gets cold. You know, it's just tough to find a rhythm. Absolutely, as Miller delivers a fastball in the same exact spot as the first pitch, up and away. Fogelsang takes a strike right down Broadway at 84 miles an hour. He's a guy who's been on base all three times. Really, I mean, in his first at bat, hit a home run, then had a fielder's choice and a base on balls after that. The fourth inning was the first inning in which he did not hit. Now we're in the bottom of the fifth as a big bender just misses the zone. Three and one the count now. A pitch looked good from here on the inner third, but home plate umpire 
said it's just a little bit too high. Three and one, Miller delivers. This one is upstairs, decidedly, and Vogelsang will trot down to first base. And Vogelsang in general is just a guy who loves to get on base. That's now the fourth time he's reached already. And even a 4-1-6 uh, on base percentage last year, always showing patience in the box, never really jumps ahead in, in or tries to get ahead in the count too much. He's he makes the pitcher really think. He, you know, you never really know what's going to happen, and that's what makes him so dangerous. And uh, you know, the experience still showing too with the, with him being a senior. And once he gets on the base pass, he's one of those guys you just sit back and watch him work because last year he led Miami with 28 stolen bases on only 30 attempts. So he's not getting caught if he's taken off. A guy who prides himself on getting really good jumps, and then he's got the speed to go along with it. Yeah, I'm sure he's pretty bummed out about it, getting caught stealing yesterday and then comes back and steals two already here today. <laughs> yeah, you won't see many caught stealings next to his name in the scorebook. Landon Stevens steps in, the three-hole hitter. He's walked in both his last two plate appearances. Struck out in his first. Vogelsang, before Landon Stevens is even in the box, Vogelsang's taken a lead and a pretty good one. Lefty Miller staring straight at him at first base. He kicks and deals. Vogelsang going nowhere, but the pitch is high, 76 miles an hour above the zone. Stevens, another guy who's content to just sit back and wait for his pitch. Done a good job of doing so for all of his Miami career, including today. The second pitch to him is a fastball right on the inside corner. Yeah, it was really close. You could see him bobbing his head back and forth, not sure if he's liking it. He had a really close call, but uh, Chuck Adia behind the plate really hasn't missed that many calls. He's been consistent. Here's the 1-1-2 one, one, Miller. That one just missing a fastball at 86 up around the hands of Stevens. Vogel saying at first base has not even faked the steal. Shortened his lead just a bit. Now extends back out as Miller looks at him. The 2-1 is upstairs as well. 3-1 the count now. Yeah, it's especially hard to steal, especially when you have a lefty on the mound because they're facing the first base bag the entire time, so they don't have the reaction time to spin around. All they have to do is do a little lollipop throw, and basically you, you get the runner to go back. So I wouldn't really expect anything too, too aggressive. Maybe a hit and run uh, if, if he gets a pitch he likes. That one is wide to Stevens, who will also walk on down to first base with the base on balls. Miller, the entire time he was kicking his leg, he would stare at Vogelsang before turning his attention back to the plate. And you always have to, obviously, with Vogelsang, and, and really pretty much anybody in, in this top half of the lineup, just do the amount of speed that, that the Red Hawks have. And, you know, you can never really take your, take your eyes off anybody because – you know, they have just such a good balance of, of power and speed uh, when it ter in terms of coming to the plate. And then on, on the bases, they can make you pay really any which way. Even Landon Stevens, the big slugger of the team, can run a little bit. Macedon start in at the corners. They'll now move back. Third baseman playing even with the bag, but the first baseman will play behind Stevens. Here's a little dribbler back to the pitcher. Miller, who will fire on a third for the out. Easy force out there, and... There's now two down in the inning. Yeah, an easy 1-5 fielder's choice. I'm sorry, one down in the inning. Get the lead runner. Smart, too, because now you got Stevens at second instead of the Speedy Bogosang at third, and anything that gets past the infield, is, you know, he's, he's going to score. So that's just smart. Good heads-up baseball by Justin Miller. And now it'll be the lefty Charlie Harrigan to face Miller, too. Not too many lefties in this lineup. we got the switch hitting Wardwell. And then Harrigan and Zap. One down, runners at first and second. Miller delivers the first pitch to Charlie Harrigan. It's a breaking ball inside and upstairs, 74 miles an hour. <laughs> Miller slowing his pace a little bit, working from the stretch with runners on base. Kicks and deals. That one's a fastball right on the outside corner at 84 miles an hour. We saw both Miller and Logan Schmitz for Miami work pretty quickly in the last inning. 
Schmitz has been working quickly and attacking hitters all day long. Miller brought much of the same from the Macedon bullpen. And he's just been the answer that, that Purdue Fort Wade needed to, to slow down this offense. You know, only a couple of base hits. He's, he's really given up a couple of runs when he came in, relief of Owen Pyatt. But still, he's looking a little bit more comfortable the, the farther he's progressed in this ballgame. Purdue Fort Wayne has a couple of arms up in the bullpen. One guy still with a jacket on. The other guy is Sean Ferguson, the junior right-hander. Miller, like I said, now in his third inning of work. He's up over 40 pitches now, so Charlie Harrigan could very well be his last batter. Tell you what, though, it would be huge if Miller can get out of this inning with, with no runs on the board. Miami's still leading 11-6 to six as Harrigan pops this one down the left field line and out of play. Two and two, the count now with one out. Runners still at first and second, so the Macedons remain in double play depth. They, along with Miller, would love for Charlie Harrigan to roll over on one right about now. So there's a nice big gap through the right side of the infield. If he can pull one through that 3-4 gap, that could do some damage as well. Time is called at home plate. Harrigan steps out, spits on his gloves, and gets back in there. Get that extra rip. That's how you know he's going to try and rip one here. <laughs> That's exactly what he looks to do here on the 2-2 pitch as Miller checks the runners. This one's too low. He can't do anything with it. An 89-mile-an-hour fastball from Miller. Miller dialed it up there. I think 89 is the fastest we've seen from him. Yeah, get that a little bit extra adrenaline in you. You want to just get yourself pumped off. If that was a strikeout, I tell you what, he probably would have been rolling. So we're shocked full here to Charlie Harrigan, who once again steps out. Miller off the mound, quickly back in. Payoff pitch, here we go. And he walked him. Charlie Harrigan will trot on down to first base, loading the bases for Miami with just an out. Cole Andrews is going to come to the plate. It doesn't look like there's any movement in the Purdue-Fort Wayne dugout, so looks like Miller is going to be left to fend for himself with this little bit of a mess he's created. Tell you what, this is a juicy situation for Cole Andrews. Second time today he's come to the plate with the bases loaded, only one out. You could still be aggressive. Still, I, I expect him to swing away. I don't necessarily even go for the fences, but try and drive in a couple more Red Hawks. Already having himself a career day and would love to add to it. Once again, we're only halfway through this ball game. As the first pitch to him is right on the inside corner, 79 miles an hour on the radar gun. Yeah, it's some nice cut action towards the end of it to drop it back into the zone. Andrews thought that was coming for his left shoulder. Miller's got some interesting velocity as he saw the fastball dial up all the way to 89 miles an hour. Then we've seen a, a cutter-like pitch kind of around 80. Breaking ball all the way down in the low 70s with that big bender. Yeah, that tail action, that's a changeup. Oh, and one. This one's on the ground towards the shortstop. They get one. Can they get two? Yes, they do. And this inning is over. So Miami, with a golden opportunity, bases loaded with one out, cannot strike. They still lead 11-6 as we head to the top of the sixth. You're listening to Red Hawk Radio. We'll be right back.
New pitcher for Miami, Grant Hartwig, enters the ballgame in relief. On the smiling side of the scoreboard, Miami sits currently 11-2-6. Yeah, Hartwig, redshirt junior out of Plymouth, Michigan, 6'5", 240 pounds, making a second appearance of the year. So he misses low there for a ball. He's only made one appearance that was at A&M, and he had a lot of arm side miss, so he's not really coming through uh, entirely. Hit a lot of hit three batters in just a third of an inning, gave up two earned runs, one walk. So, and, and like you said before, he's a guy coming off of Tommy John, still trying to just find his groove. Yeah, he's played with his arm angle as the first batter he faces, Lucas Kolovitz, singles into center field. He's playing with his arm angle, usually a guy who would come over the top, but since that Tommy John surgery has kind of adjusted to more of a three-quarter delivery. Yeah, I don't, I, It takes a little bit of tension off the elbow, and, and that's really you know what he needs after – he partially tore his UCL in two different places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a tough injury to come back from, and unfortunately, it's a lot of it's an injury that a lot of guys uh, throughout baseball, young and older, are are dealing with. Is is Tommy John? It's kind of hard to not find somebody who hasn't had it. Uh, it's just an overuse injury, and it's just tough as a ball player to come back from it. Good thing for him is he feels pretty comfortable and confident with where his pitches are or have returned to. He's about the same velocity. He'll touch the low 90s with his fastball. And he really took the time to focus on his other pitches as well, his breaking stuff, as Travis up steps into the box. The first pitch he sees is fouled back into the netting. 89-mile-an-hour fastball as Hartwig readies on the mound. He will not check the runner, Kolovitz. Kicks and deals. This one is fouled. Another foul ball. This will be towards the left side and out of play. I think for Hartwick, too, last summer, this past summer, I should say, he played for the Lakeshore Chinooks up in the Northwoods League. Uh, you know, that's kind of his first real opportunity to to throw in an in-game situation. He had fairly good numbers. I believe he had a below of a four ERA, uh, which especially in wood bat summer ball is pretty dang good. You know, it's, it's tough, too. You get so much talent up there. There's all different types of players from all different backgrounds. So uh, getting back into that kind of game situation, I'm sure, helped. The third pitch is popped and lands softly in the Miami bullpen. Out of play, 0-2, oh, the count remains. Yeah, Hartwig talked about his time last summer with the Chinooks and said it was just crucial. He got off to a really good start, and that confidence is key when you're coming back from an injury, especially a difficult one that keeps you out for mm -hmm. a season plus. We have not seen Grant Hartwig pitch at home in two years nearly. Yeah, Missed all of last season and the final month or so of his previous season. This one upstairs, 89 miles an hour on the radar gun. One and two, the count now. So up, being patient, waiting on his pitch as he spoiled a couple. And now takes that fastball up and away. A little bit of a juicy pitch with two strikes. Kolovitz remains at first base. Not a huge lead for him. Hartwig not paying a whole lot of attention to him. The one, two. This one fouled back over us <laughs> out on the concourse behind home plate. Yeah, you could see him trying to attack the zone, not trying to get too fancy and and work around the batter. He's throwing to him, allowing some contact, and that's crucial too. Uh, just to in, in part of that is, is gaining your confidence back, knowing that you can get somebody out by making them work. He talked about that too. His whole mind, you know, his whole mindset changed or shifted. It's more about coming after the guy and really trusting yourself rather than trying to make the perfect pitch, which he might have done there. Sets one just off the outside corner, a breaking ball at 80 miles an hour. Count runs even at two and two. I love that bulldog mentality from pitchers, and that's what Hartwig says he has as he kicks and delivers. Swing and a miss from up. He's retired on strikes. Nice little breaking pitch there. Got him on the changeup. Again, that's a big confidence booster. That's his first strikeout since coming back. Uh, I'm sure he's got he kind of could see a little bit of a smile on his face. You know what? You know, you know what's great about that is he had a teammate teach him that changeup during his injury. So during his re rehab, he kind of learned that Vulcan grip changeup, yeah. which is almost more of a split finger fastball than it is a changeup. Gets a lot of that drop movement, which is good. Absolutely, that's what he got there. And the first pitch. To the next batter, Dylan Stewart is in there for a called strike. Looked like the same exact pitch, 78 miles an hour on the gun. Yeah, that's tough, too, because of that three-quarter arm release. 
So it looks like it's going to drop lower, and it looks like it's coming in like a fastball, and then all of a sudden you could see it drop about a quarter of the way from the plate, and you think it's going to drop to the dirt, but it only drops a little bit. So, again, that's just great command. Try to come back with a fastball in the same spot. Got it in just a little bit too much. One and one the count. The 1-1, one, one, same exact spot, just missing inside. So once again, Grant Hartwig showing no mercy and really no hesitation to come inside, but just hasn't been able to find the zone on his last two pitches. Part two of that three-quarter arm slot that he has, it's it's tough to sort of tell what pitch that's coming because of the velocity, or I should say the angle that that ball's coming at, so you can really hardly ever tell what's coming at you until about a quarter of the way. Strike two is called, 79 miles an hour, really relying on that little change up. Yeah, it has some great movement. It's, again, he's a righty, so it's going to drop a little bit more inside, kind of like a screwball-ish, uh, but it's going to drop back a little bit instead of, you know, tailing off like a, like a uh, four-seam fastball uh, to his left. It's going to cut back a little bit to the right side. Stewart crowding the plate. Hartwig almost picks off the runner at first base, Kolovitz, who just dives back in safely. I'll tell you what, that throw was in time. A little bit of a hesitation, though, by Harrigan. That could have been really close, though. That was a violent turn by Hartwig, who just threw his best fastball right over to Charlie Harrigan at first base. First base umpire Darren Brown says no, he's back. Hartwig ready's on the mound. He kicks in Dio's. This is a breaking ball. In the dirt, runs the count full. Are we looking down at that that sign booklet on his wrist? Little bracelet that these Miami pitchers are wearing. Steps back on the mound and he readies. Kicks and deals. That one's high and inside. So Stewart will walk on down to first base. Aaron Chapman will bat now. He bats from the right side against the righty Hartwig. Hartwig running into a little bit of trouble in this inning. Two on, one out. Runners on first and second base. As he looks at the runner, now delivers. And a perfect pitch that cuts from really Chapman's knees to the inside corner. Four strike one. Taking his time out there. A little bit of a contrast from Logan Schmidt, who we saw work very quickly. This one's a little tapper behind home plate. Kind of goes towards the Miami dugout and actually into the Miami dugout. Oh, and two. Hartwig really getting ahead of these Mastodon batters. Yeah, that's what you got to do. It builds, builds confidence. It's uh, It just makes you feel a lot better, and it's good to see Grant Hartwig back to where you know this this entire Red Hawks staff expected him to be. Chapman been on in two of his three plate appearances, but there he strikes out for out number two. Hartwig got him on the changeup again beneath the zone. Yeah, again, it's that late movement that has it die down, especially if you look at that spin on the ball. It's, it's, oh, it's again, it's that circular motion that makes that ball drop. And he's getting a lot of uh, that spin rate that's up. You know, that's what generates all that movement. So, And that's especially tough, too, with, with, with Tommy John to get that spin rate back up. And uh, it's nice to see that, that Hartwig's finding that. Third base coach having a word with the home plate umpire. They're going to pinch run here. Kolovitz is going to come off, and it's going to be Drew Reich, the senior outfielder who trots on over to second base. He's going to take Kolovitz's place, presumably in the field as well. Kolovitz, the right fielder. And Jack Lang is going to be the batter. He has reached base twice today, once on an air and once on a single, which he was promptly picked off of first base. That was back in the second inning. 
all the way back on our starter for the day as Hartwig, during a timeout, delivers a ball that goes past the catcher, almost hits the umpire. Time granted to the batter just before the pitch. Laying back in the box, he readies for the first pitch against him. Hartwig will kick and deal. That one's in there for a called strike, 76 miles an hour. Yeah, it looked like a slider that time, had great movement moving from his right to left. Again, coming across it a little bit more, not under throwing that or that early release that would have hit him inside like he had at Texas A&M. Excuse me. We've seen Hartwig miss inside a couple of times, but nothing too egregious. Oh, and one the count now. Here's the pitch. That one is in the dirt. Runners will stay put as Cole Andrews hops on it pretty quickly. Ball just squirted away a little bit up the first baseline. One and one the count now. Cole Andrews, I think, is he's going to really emerge, if he hasn't already, as somebody who is going to be dangerous in the Mid-American Conference, just based off his freshman year, how he's playing already today uh, and, and this year in general. You know, and another good block here on that pitch in the, in the dirt. As Hartwig gets Lang to swing and miss, Andrews is a guy we saw last year with a lot of designated hitter work, mm -hmm. really getting his chance to play the field consistently this season. Yeah, he's just making a second start behind the plate, had one, uh, one game of action in, in the Texas A&M series, started game one of the, of the season, and then pinch hit twice in that so, series. So while he may be a developing guy behind the plate, he has no slouch in the batter's box as a fielder's choice will end this inning. Third baseman delivers on to Will Vogelsang at second base, and the side is retired. Miami still leads 11-6. to six. We will go to the bottom of six. You're listening to Red Hawk Radio. No change on the mound for Purdue Fort Wayne. Justin Miller still out there kicking, but we do have some changes in the field. Drew Rick came on as a pinch hitter or a pinch runner, excuse me, in the second, uh, the last frame. He's out there in left field now, and from left to right, from left to right moves Robert Young. Tyler Wardwell, the hitter. First two pitches of him miss, so he's sitting with an. 2-0 count against Justin Miller. Now in his second at-bat as a right-handed hitter, hit the first couple left-handed as a switch hitter as he fouls one into the Miami dugout. 
could hear the hot soup ringing throughout it. I think Stephen Kraus loved that one. They're going to have to find a new ringleader yeah, this new year. Yeah, ringleader for hot soup. With Cole Gannett's graduating last spring. We mentioned Grant Hartwig playing for the Lakeshore Chinooks, and Cole Gannett's, that's where it all started. Yeah, you heard a teammate say it one time and really liked it as that pitch is in there for a college strike right down the middle to Tyler Wardwell. Miller will deliver the 2-2. That one's a breaking ball. It plunks Wardwell right on the knee, and he'll run on down to first base. That's yeah, the only time, or I should say just the second time in this ballgame that the leadoff runner has not made it, uh, or I should say the leadoff batter has not gotten, or has gotten on board, excuse me, uh, getting tripped up there. You know, just a couple of times, Parker Massman in the second, he flew out to right to lead things off, and then Cole Andrews in the fourth did the same thing. But again, there's another hit by pitch to get on base. Same thing happened in the first inning. A walk happened in the fifth, as did in the second. Brian Zapp steps in for the lefty-lefty matchup. He squares to bunt, gets one down. It's right back to Miller, the pitcher, who will easily fire on the first for the out. But Tyler Wardwell moves up 90 feet, and he's now in scoring position at second base. One out now for Parker Massman. Yeah, go back to that small ball to get some runs back on the board. Smart. You know, one, uh, nobody out, just runner on first. Good sacrifice bunt laid down by Brian Zapp. You get Parker Massman up, who can hopefully get, the, get his bat back going again that we saw his freshman year, and then he got the top of the order. We're now in the bottom of the sixth inning. Miami leads 11-6, to six, but the scoring has slowed down. Miami has not put any runs on the board since they tallied three in the third. Purdue-Fort Wayne scored four in the first two innings and then scored two in the fifth after going or went scoreless in the sixth. As this one gets Massman on the leg. So another hit batter. It might not be a terrible play for the Macedons as now they have a runner on first base who could potentially be doubled up, even though the speedy Christian Tejada, the leadoff hitter, is now at the plate. Now if you're the Macedons, and I think now you kind of expect the bunt. There's a, there's a really cool system that some college coaches are adapting. It's called statistical bunting, where it's if you have runners on first and second and nobody out and you lay down a bunt, a runner has 60% chance, or at least one runner has uh, a 60% chance of coming around to score. And in a situation like this with one out, there's a 42% chance if they lay down the bunt. And knowing Danny Hayden trying to just get some runs back on the board, maybe kind of go to the bunt, but maybe not necessarily with, with the top of the order. Look at you wowing people with the smarts there, Bennett Wise. I know, man. I learned a little bit of baseball. <laughs> Is that the Miami University education? I wish. Oh, <laughs> no, oh I'm shoot. Just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Now that's summer ball. <laughs> First pitch to Christian Tejada is fouled out of play behind the plate. 0-1 oh, to him. Tejada did not square, has not showed bunt on the second pitch either as he takes inside. 87 miles an hour on the fastball from Justin Miller. So he's not losing any velocity as he stays out there longer. Brought some stability to this Purdue Fort Wayne team after they cycled through pitchers like it was their job in the first couple innings. Runner going, and he will get third base. That's Tyler Wardwell out there. Parker Massman stays put at first base. Again, just aggressive base running paying off for the Red Hawks. Yeah, now runners on the corners. Wardwell got some speed as he just pulled off his, uh, his first stolen base to the, as a Red Hawk. It's an interesting move because Massman has some speed at first base. I don't know mm -hmm. if he missed the sign because the, the double play ball still is in order. He'll stay put on this pitch as Tejada takes away. 86-mile-an-hour fastball that misses off the outside corner, 3-1. and one. Massman looking over to Danny Hayden, his head coach and third base coach for the sign. He's got a pretty small lead over there, and he goes nowhere, but Miller throws over.
Runners on the corner with one out. Sehat has been a guy who's been on the base paths all day long but still does not have a hit as he puts a hearty cut on that one, fouls it back into the netting behind home plate. Three and two the count now. Tejada was the first hit by pitch for the Red Hawks today. He led off their half of the first inning with a hit by pitch. Both the runners on base right now reach base the same way as that one is spoiled off to the right side and in the parking lot. With a full count, Tejada adopting a little bit of a defensive stance here. You know, it's tough, too, if you're, if you're the Mastodons because... You've given up six walks, and then you've hit five batters. That's 11 free total bases that you've given Miami, and that's part of the reason they've been able to capitalize and, and be up by five right now. Yeah, that correlates with the amount of runs Miami has, 11, as Tejada strikes out swinging. Pitch a little bit beneath his knees. Two outs now. Yeah, Miami only has six hits. The Mastodon have actually out-hit Miami 8-6. to six. Has not led to the scoreboard, though, as Miami leads 11-6. And now Terrazzi play for the matchup. It looks like they're going to bring in a, a righty to here to face Vogel saying. We're going to head to a quick break while they make the pitching change. We'll be right back on Red Hawk Radio. Chris Vanell back with Bennett Wise here at McKee Field at Hayden Park. Miami leads 11-6, to and we have a new pitcher on the mound here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Two outs in the inning as Will Vogelsang steps to the plate. Sean Ferguson for the Mastons is your new pitcher. As he, his first pitch goes way inside. Vogelsang actually tried to bunt that, was able to pull back just in time and dive out of the way. 1-0 the count to him. Bolt move two with two outs. Runners on the corners trying to lay down the bunt. I get it be aggressive, and he has the speed to make it up. I guess they weren't uh, anticipating it too, the, the third baseman Garrett Muller wasn't expecting it he's playing even with the bag so that probably would have been successful had it been in the zone Will Vogelsang can run now, don't be mistaken as the second pitch to him is a lot slower Ferguson slows him down to 78 miles an hour and puts it right down the middle Vogelsang takes all the way One 
One and one, now the count to Will Vogel saying runner's still on the corners. Ferguson will take a look at third base, leaves the runner at second or first who goes, and this one is ripped back up the middle on the ground. That'll score one run. Parker Massman is being waved around. There's a throw home, and he will slide in safely head first, loses his lid as he rounds third, and Will Vogelsang heads to second base. He drives in two more for the Red Hawks, and the lead is now 13-6 to six with two outs in the bottom of the sixth. I'll tell you what, that was going to be a really, really close play. Just got under the glove of Lang at short. He's having a tough day in general. He has uh, both airs for uh, Purdue-Fort Wayne today, and again, just got unlucky, gloved a little bit under as the ball scooted it. Uh, into the left center field gap. But still, that's heads up uh, running and, and hustle, too, by Massman to score all the way from first, add some runs for Miami. It's, it's the first run since the third. Absolutely. As Landon Stevens steps into the batter's box now. Doesn't do much for your confidence when the first batter in the game rips a two-run double off you as Stevens takes four called strike. Yeah, that was a good slider. Trying to get that inside part of the plate. Had some nice break towards the end of it to get the inside corner. Long pause between pitcher and batter. Ferguson steps off as he sees Vogel saying at second base with his lead. The runner will retreat. You talk about discipline, too, and all of this coming with, with two outs. That's Volga saying being aggressive, uh, being being down in the count, getting it out in, in front of the ball, able to get it to the opposite side of the field and, and generating some, some offense that's been needed for, for the Red Hawks to get out to this lead. They now lead by seven. So, again, it's just it's discipline, and that's now the fifth time today that Vogel saying's reached. And Miami's hoping that discipline and – their attitude of, you know, we're going to manufacture runs any way we can. They're hoping that leads to a lot of wins this year like it did last year. A lot of the core of the lineup at least returning. Have to replace some guys on the pitching staff, but Danny Hayden and the pitchers believe they have the talent to do so. One and one, the count to Landon Stevens. A little bit of an open stance from him as the pitch is delivered. This one's grounded on towards the third baseline. Danny Hayden tried to make a play on that ball, was unable to, and he comes up smiling. God, you can see that grin all the way from up here, man. He wanted that one. Every time there's a ball near him, he'll go running after it, and he was a catcher, so it's not like he has some third base pe pedigree or anything like that. Still, it's the quick reflexes to be able to go over and make that play. I'm sure if you ask him, he'd say they're cat-like. I'm sure if he wanted to, he could. He would have his glove out there. <laughs> Stevens the one and two. He's ready for it as Ferguson looks in for the sign. Two outs. Will Vogel saying on second base. Plenty of speed to score on a hit. The one two is upstairs. 88 miles an hour trying to get him with that little chase pitch. Stevens doesn't bite and runs the count to two and two. Long look back at Vogel saying, who dances, and he'll go. A little bit of a hit and run on as Landon Stevens protecting his runner. Swings at a pitch way inside. Looks like he might have even gotten his knee if he didn't swing on that one. Count stays at two and two. This is the first real test that Sean Ferguson has had. He, he played against in the first series against Longwood. Only faced two batters and gave up a walk. And uh, he also recorded a save in that one as well in facing those two batters. So uh, only a total of a third of an inning. So this is kind of his first real test of the year, and, and this is this is kind of a huge sign too if you're Purdue-Fort Wayne for, for somebody that you can go to out of the bullpen. Ferguson with another. He double takes looking at Vogelsang, and Steven slaps this one on the ground between the shortstop and the third baseman. They're going to wave Vogelsang around, and he will score without a throw. It'll be cut off. Stevens takes second base, and the Red Hawks play add-on. And, of course, Vogel saying loses the helmet in the process, rounding third base. Every time, without textbook. fail. Textbook. It's like Danny Hayden teaches that. We've seen Massman do that. We see Vogel saying do it every time. Well, I mean, it does. It makes you more aerodynamic. <laughs> you got, the, you got the, you know, the helmet flap you know, getting in your way. You're ruining, you know, losing precious speed there. You've got to take yeah. advantage of it. And it looks even better if you're like Will Vogel saying and you got some floppy hair that you oh, know, yeah. flies in the wind. 
Some nice lettuce. <laughs> Ooh, got him on the backside. Steven Krause, first pitch he sees, hits him right on the butt. He'll go down to first base, and now there's two guys on once again. So the Red Hawks still threatening here with two outs where they've done all of their damage. Three runs added on in this frame. 14-6 to six is their lead now. Six hit batters today by this pitching staff from, from the Mastodons. That, that needs to change. That's <laughs> to put it bluntly, Bennett Wise. I mean, I don't want to say it's inexcusable, but I, I get it. It's the beginning of the year. You got to find your find your groove. But six is a lot. It's cold, man, and there have been plenty of Macedon pitchers today. As the first pitch is in there for a called strike against Charlie Harrigan. Landon Stevens, he can run a bit too. He's out there at second base. I'd imagine he'll stay put at least until the ball is put in play by Charlie Harrigan as Harrigan takes a 76-mile-an-hour breaking pitch off the outside corner. He thought about that one, was able to hold back. Ferguson dangles his arm looking in for the sign. He'll now turn and look at Landon Stevens, who isn't going anywhere. He delivers a fastball off the outside corner. Count now at two and one. Two outs in this inning. Ferguson just praying, hey, I got to get out of here. Still only in the bottom of the sixth inning. This has been a pretty long game as we've seen 20 runs put up between these two teams. Miami with 14. 20 runs and only 16 combined hits as this one is skied over us behind home plate. Out of play by Charlie Harrigan. Benny, you bring your glove today? I did not. I normally do. I did this summer whenever I was on the road. We've had a couple that came close to, to our broadcast booth uh, when I was traveling around the Northwoods League, and I would always bring it. Uh, I did have one drop right in front of us. There was a <laughs> slanted roof uh, up in Traverse City. It was really cool, and uh, foul ball right behind home plate. Drops down, starts rolling down the roof. I just stuck my hand out and went two feet to the right. Nearly had one, though. I, I would have been very excited. Have I ever told you guys about uh, Bennett Wise's softball glove? It's legendary. Have I ever, have I ever talked about that? The 2-2 two -two to Harrigan is lined back up the middle. This one's going to drop, and Landon Stevens will come around. He'll score. They're going to wave around Steven Krause and actually going to hold him as the outfielders get the ball back into the infield pretty quickly. Krause isn't the most fleet of foot, but he was chugging right along. Danny Hayden thought about it and says, uh, we're actually going to hold you. Yeah, it's just smart. You know, you're already up by nine right now with that run scoring. Might as well play it safe. But a nice double by Charlie Harrigan to add, uh, to add that to his resume for the year. That's his first double. Yeah, with Harrigan now sitting at second base, two runners still in scoring position here with two outs. And Cole Andrews, who's had himself a day, steps into the batter's box. Yeah, going back to Bennett Wise's softball glove, Bennett is the best center fielder in the history of Miami intramural softball. I won't go that far. but Absolutely, I would go that far. Gold glove winner. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is not because he's super fleet of foot or super talented. You know, Bennett Wise has his fair share of talents. I'm not going to say center field's one of them. Yes. As Cole Andrew takes a uh, strike <laughs> on the first pitch <laughs> he sees. But he's got this glove that when he opens it up, it covers the sun like a cloud. And so he's able to just pretty much stand pat, cover the gaps, and a little bit of everything. So it makes you the best center fielder in intramural Miami history. Second pitch is in there for another college strike, breaking ball at the knees on the outside corner. I can't take Chris Finnell anywhere. You really can't. 0-2 <laughs> the count now to Cole Andrews. Oh, man. He's been aggressive in his plate approach today. It all started with a bomb back in the first inning that he hit. Sure, he'd love another here. Miami looking to go up by double digits with one more run, and he swings and misses. This one's in the dirt, so it's going to require a throw down to first base. But that's no problem for Dylan Stewart, the catcher. And the side is retired. When we come back, the uber-talented Bennett Wise once again will return to play-by-play. -play. I'm Chris Finnell. Miami leads this one 15-6 on Red Hawk Radio.
Ben Wise and Chris Finnell back with you from the key field at Hayden Park. Miami currently leading 15-6 to over the Macedons of Purdue-Fort Lane. It'll be the three, four, and five hitters for the Macedons. Garrett Lake now to face the righty Garrett, excuse me, Grant Hartwig, who throws a first-pitch fastball at 88 for a strike against the lefty Garrett Lake. Lake one for three today with a single in the, and a run scored in the fifth. Grounded out back to... Ken Egbert, who started out on the mound for the Red Hawks, and then grounded out to short back in the third. Hardwick now with the 1-0, comes with an off-speed pitch. That looked to be the change-up that time, but it misses too far inside on the lefty right near the hands. It's 1-1. One one. Red Hawks putting up four runs in the bottom half of the sixth. Put up five in the first, three in the second, and third. This one is fouled off right behind the backstop by Garrett Lake to put the count at one and two. Hartwig, a bigger guy, 6'5", 240 pounds, as we've mentioned. A redshirt junior from Plymouth, Michigan. Didn't play at all last year after dealing with Tommy John surgery. Great to see him back on the mound as now the Red Hawks a little bit of a shift. The right side of the infield playing back. Will Vogel saying in shallow right center field. This one is a high chopper right over the second base. Back charging over is Tyler Wardwell from short, but it gets by him into center field and a leadoff single for Garrett Lake. That was one of those high choppers where both middle infielders have a chance at it. Neither able to come through as Lake plants it in the perfect, perfect spot. Yeah, it's tough too with that shift with Vogel saying all the way uh, out there towards right shallow right center field as we now have a uh, pinch hitting situation in for the designated hitter, Alex Evenson. He will now be replaced by number 11, Evan Huffman, who is a junior. So it's a second substitution made by the Mastodons today. The first one was replacing the right fielder, Lucas Kolovitz, and he was replaced by Drew Rich, who moved into left field, and then Robert Young the third moved out into right as Hartwig are now up 0-2 on the right-handed pinch hitter, Huffman. Huffman only has two plate appearances this season so far. One hit, which was a double, and he walked once, stole a base as well. So kind of stuff in the stat sheet and a little bit of action. Red Hawks at double play depth as Hartwig comes set from the stretch. And the 0-1 comes home, tries to go with a slider, but it misses in near the belt, and it's 1-1. One one. Sun has gone away. It was fading out for most of this ballgame, but hasn't popped out since probably around the fifth inning. Temperatures still in the mid to high 40s. Went now shifting from home plate to left center field, now to out to right center field as Hartwig trying to work that inside edge but doesn't get the call from the home plate umpire to put it at 2-1. and one. I don't know which way the wind's going, but I'm cold from all sides at the moment. Sounds about right. Been nippy. <laughs> Been nippy out here on the concourse at Hayden Park. But still, it can't complain about baseball. Oh, no. No, sir. Wait for this moment a long time just to – Get some baseball back in Ohio as now the 2-1 comes home. Check swing. Doesn't matter. It was a strike all the way. And it evens the count at two aside. Yeah, we're only in mid-February. I mean, we got more than three months left of this. This being our first game on Red Hawk Radio in, what, nine, ten months? Something Sounds like about that. right, yeah. It's been too long, Ben Wise. It has been too long. <laughs> it feels good. Sure does, as the 2-2 fouled off behind home plate. More towards the right side, even with that first base side dug out of the Mastodons. Count remains two balls and two strikes with nobody out in the top of the seventh. Miami leading 15-6, to six, nine hits apiece for both teams and two errors defensively for Purdue-Fort Wayne and only one for Miami. Michael Spinozzi back up, just getting loose. No aggressive tossing yet for the Red Hawks. A little bit of action on the right side bullpen for Purdue for Wayne. It's Hartwig throws over to first, but the throw basically even with the neck of Charlie Harrigan, no tag applied. Again, that's Garrett Lake at first base. The junior out of Henderson, Nevada, as now Evan Huffman steps back into the batter's box for Purdue for Wayne. 
Huffman, a junior out of Warren, Indiana. Fouls went off again this time down the first baseline. Harrigan giving it a look, but it lands up into the concourse. Overall, pitching in this series, done a fairly good job by Danny Hayden's staff. Tyler Bosma getting the start yesterday. He went five innings, allowed eight hits, only three earned runs, six strikeouts. But the, stole, the show was really stolen by the reliever in that one, Jacob Webb, who earned his first save for Miami after allowing four hits and four strikeouts. So a good day for him as the 2-2. Shallow left center field, a couple of Red Hawks going back. But this one is Tyler Wardwell moving over from short and shallow left center field to make the grab for out number one. Garrett Lake remains stationary on that first base bag as we have another pinch hitter. This is number eight, Trenton Stoner, to replace Garrett Muller. So the Mastodons trying to go to their bench, find an answer, generate some offense to cut into this nine-run lead held by the Red Hawks, who currently defensively sit at double play depth. Cole Andrews gets up a little bit from his squad as he looks for an elevated pitch, and this one's popped up just beyond second base. Moving over is Will Vogel saying a short leap up in the air, and he makes the catch for out number two. It was almost like a little skip up as he went to go catch that ball. Graceful. That was very graceful, like a cow. Like <laughs> a cow. That was, that was the great, that had the gracefulness of a cow. What are you talking about? Just a beautiful little quick movement. Cows can be beautiful. But it was not the cows that I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> like a cow. And again, we're going to have a pinch hitter. This is going to be number six, Ryan Millette. He is a freshman. And he'll be replacing Robert Young the third in the lineup, so trying to go to the bench, get some younger guys involved are the Mastodons. And he takes the first pitch, 88 on a fastball from Grant Hartwig for a strike, 0-1. Again, two outs here in the top of the seventh. Miami leading 15-6. to six. Purdue Fort Wayne does have a runner on first in Garrett Lake. As they have stranded five on bases. Up to this point in the ball game, Hartwig a small glance home, and now the 0-1 gets the outer half of the plate for a strike, and that's that changeup again, Chris. Yeah, it's it's working very well, and Hartwig seems to be going to it early and often. Doesn't matter the count, doesn't matter the situation. He feels pretty confident in it, and that's that's crucial for a guy who's coming off of injuries and really trying to develop that new pitch while doing it. It's tough enough just to come back and try to regain full strength, but when you're trying to work in a new pitch says something about his development with that pitch and just overall. The 0-2 runner goes, doesn't matter. It's swung on and now it actually gets all the way to the backstop. So a drop third strike and now the Mastodons have another chance here in the seventh. With two outs and <laughs> Hartwig staring down his catcher, having a couple words. Probably nothing too uh, mean-spirited or anything, but yeah. he would have loved to get out of the inning right there. Now that's just a Tom Jackson. Come on, man. Come on, man. So now Drew Rich to the plate. He is one for one with a single after coming in for Lucas Kolovitz. Hartwig dealing with runners on first and second. Looks back towards that second base bag before coming home, delivering an 89 mile an hour fastball low and inside as Rich took a nice hearty swing at it. So a drop third strike extends this inning as Ryan Millette able to beat out the run as now Hartwig turns around. Vogel saying a little bit late to cover the bag. Still applies the tag but doesn't get the call. That was Millette's second strikeout of this series. He appeared yesterday's ball game, pinch hit and struck out. This one a little more productive though as it continues the inning and puts him on base. Hartwood gets the sign, looks down at his wrist to get 
The exact pitch going, siphoning the ball through that right hand. Now puts it in his glove up at his chest. Comes set at the letters, now looks back to second and comes home in the 0-1. Fastball 89 right down the middle. A juicy pitch that time to put the count at 0-2. Once again, I love the aggressiveness. He's just saying, hey, I'm going to put it right there. You come hit it. And it's worked so far. Danny Hayden would love for another inning or two out of his big right-hander. Yeah, the fewer arms you have to use, the better is now the 0-2. Tapped foul up the third baseline. Brian Zapp there. Should have that ball been fair. But another chance here for the Mastodons to... Try and get some runs back on the board again. They trail by 9, 15 to 6 in favor of the Red Hawks here in the top of the seventh. Garrett Lake at second. Ryan Mullet at first. And the 0-2 comes home and stays alive as he taps it back to the netting. This time on the left side towards the on-deck circle of the Miami Red Hawks, third base side. The on-deck circles are new. Those are pretty nice. Had some script Miami, white circle, red lettering. We've seen a lot of the, the Red Hawk teams go to that yeah. more script Miami lettering. I like it. I do. It's sleek. And the baseball team was actually one of the ones who, who've been using that the longest, mm -hmm. at least in current iteration. Yeah, from, yeah. The, from these tops and, and, and the lids too. Yeah. But we've seen the basketball team adopt that this year with some Miami uh, uh, heritage jerseys and football team with some script Miami helmets. Mm -hmm. O2 fouled off again by R Rich. He stays alive. Talk about that script lettering Miami with the white pinstripe bottoms. They have thick red stripes going down the left and right sides of the legs and then the right, excuse me, the red tops, white lettering that script Miami and then a white script M on the hat, all red. It's sleek. It looks good. Now Hartwig, the 0-2. High fly ball into left. This could be some trouble. It is tailing foul, but it stays fair, and it's off the wall. Sliding in was Parker Massman. He overshot the ball. He now picks it up and throws to the cutoff man. That's Wardwell who throws it to third. Tag will not be in time. That is an RBI triple for Drew Rich, and he is now two for two in pinch hitting appearances. Rich absolutely tattooed that ball. I think Parker Massman thought that was going out of the ballpark. He kind of slowed up as the... Uh, Ball hit off the wall and just went right past him. And this inning all got extended. It, it, uh, Grant Hartwig gets credit for the strikeout of Ryan Millette, but the drop third strike, you know, paying off here for Purdue Fort Wayne. So they score two in this inning. Cuts down the Miami lead to seven as Hartwig now faces Travis up, who swings on the first pitch, and that's a strike. First baseman is one for three today, reached and scored on a fielder's choice in the second, singled in the fourth, struck out back in the sixth. That was Hartwig's first strikeout of the season and first coming back since Tommy John. See now with the 0-1, paints that inside corner and it's 0-2. Good pitch, not really anything up can do there. He kind of turned his front shoulder back, thinking it might be just a little bit inside, but instead it paints that inside corner right at the belt. So it's Drew Rich at third base after that two RBI triple. Hartwig now the 0-2, ripped into the right center gap, moving over to Landon Stevens. He dives and he got it. Diving play by Landon Stevens to get the Red Hawks out of the inning. Two runs put up, though, by the Purdue Fort Wayne Mastodons as we move now to the bottom of the seventh. Time to stretch from Aiden Park here on Red Hawk Radio.
whole lot of changes coming up. First for the Miami Red Hawks. Out of the game will be Tyler Wardwell. He's replaced by the freshman out of Gross Point, Michigan, Billy Kopicki. Stands at 6'1", 179 pounds. Got some action in the Texas A&M series. But that was uh, in a pinch running roll as he takes the first pitch for a strike. And then a whole slew of changes for Purdue, Fort Wayne. Robert Young the third comes out of the game. Ryan Millett replaces him in right field as now Kapicki in a 1-1 count as the ball skipped up over the glove of Dylan Stewart. Drew Rich remains out in left field. Trenton Stoner replaces Garrett Muller at third base, and that is all the defensive changes. Actually, I'm even forgetting one. A new pitcher on the mound for the Mastodons. And then it comes home, and that's outside and high on a fastball, and that's now 2-1 and one on Kapicki. Yeah, Andrew Lavier is the new pitcher for the Mastodons, and he's a guy who plays all over the diamond, plays a little bit of corner, corner infield, and he actually started a couple of games early on in this year at first base. We saw him two nights ago against Miami in a relief role. He pitched two-thirds of an inning, gave up one hit, one walk, one strikeouts, no runs. So he's a guy who's pretty versatile, and he'll look to uh, close this one out for the Mastodons. 2-2 goes with a breaking ball. Looks to be a curveball that misses inside on Kapiki to put the count at 3-2. and two. That 1-2 pitch was a fastball that Kapiki swung on and missed, and now the count is full with nobody out in the bottom of the seventh. Miami leading 15-8 to eight here over the Mastodons of Purdue-Fort Wayne. Well, here comes set, swinging and missing is Kapiki, and he'll go take a seat on the bench, and up now will be Brian Zapp. Zap today just one for two, laid down a sacrifice bunt in the sixth, singled in the fourth, and was hit by a pitch and scored in the third. Flew out to left in his first plate appearance in the first inning. As he now has a righty-lefty matchup. Zap swings on the first pitch and right on his knees. Travis up, makes a great catch at first base to retire Brian Zap. That was tough, was down on one knee, backhanded that on the fly to get the out. So quickly two away, Andrew LeVere working through the first two batters easily as he now will face Parker Massman. Took seven pitches to retire those two batters as the righty working from the windup. Slow release, turns, pivots, Massman swinging on the first pitch, belting it out into center field. Moving back is Garrett Lake. He squeezes the glove, makes the catch for out number three. Three up, three down, go the Red Hawks for the first time today. Finally an answer for the Mastodons as Andrew LeVere comes in relief, retires all three batters he faces, and we will move to the top of the eighth inning. Coming up next here on Red Hawk Radio.
changes galore here in Hayden Park as Miami now making a couple defensive changes. Michael Spinozzi on the mound delivers a first pitch strike to the catcher, Dylan Stewart. And it's 0-1, and that's not only the defensive change. Billy Kopicki will replace Tyler Wardwell at shortstop. And again, Chris, it's Danny Hayden going to get two guys who had never played before. He wants to get those young guys involved early. Yeah, and he's mentioned that multiple times as this one slapped back up the middle for a base hit. He's mentioned that multiple times early on in this season, and, and this is the perfect series to do it. You know, you're going for a series sweep, and you're up 15-8. to eight. You know, there's only two innings left, so perfect time to get those guys some experience and hopefully still close out this win and this series. So now the Mastodon's really going to the bench. Pinch hitting for Aaron Chapman will be number 21, Luke Miles. Miles only has one plate appearance on the year. Didn't really go his way, didn't even reach base as he now faces Spinozzi in his first appearance. And it's a first pitch strike at a fastball, 87 on the outer edge for a strike. And Spinozzi, a transfer from Tyler Junior College, coming over with Michael Morissette from Tyler Juco, right hand here. 6'1, 189 pounds. Hails from South Lake, Texas. As he gives a quick nod, and the 0-1 comes home. Goes right over his glove, but luckily Vogel saying there is there at second. Kopicki now over to first, and the double play is turned. Michael Spinozzi now with two outs on a great double play led up by this Red Hawk defense. Yeah, the ball always seems to find you as soon as you come in the game. That was the, uh, the thing with Kopicki. He got a chance to turn the double play and turned it well. 6-4-3 double play turned by the Red Hawks. That's their fourth turn double play so far, and there's another change by the Mastodons. Get that to you in a second. That is Charles Lyons to replace Jack Lang. Now Spinozzi the 1-0, chopped towards short. Kopicki has it, sidearms it to first. And Harrigan says, thank you, I'll take that. And a three up, sort of three down inning as the Red Hawks are able to commit, or to, excuse me, turn a double play and head now to the bottom of the eighth with a seven run lead. Again, it is Miami 15, Purdue Fort Wayne eight here on Red Hawk Radio.
Bottom of the eighth from Hayden Park alongside Chris Vanell. I'm Bennett Wise, and it has been all Miami from the jump, unless you're in the top of the first when Purdue Fort Wayne put up two. Then the Red Hawks come back with five runs of their own, and it all started when Christian Tejada was hit by a pitch back in the first, and his, wow, he is at the plate for the Miami Red Hawks to face Andrew Lavier, who came in last inning in relief, delivers a curveball right down the middle for a strike. Lavier replaced Sean Ferguson, who only went a third of an inning, gave up three hits, two earned runs, one strikeout. And Lavier isn't even listed as a pitcher on this <laughs> Mastodon roster. He's listed as a first base, third baseman, as this one is ripped through the right side. Sliding over is Charles Lyons, one of the changes for Purdue Fort Wayne, but no throw over to first. That would have been a long throw and a very tough throw at that. So Christian Tejada is safe at first. So he'd add to the confusion, Trenton Stoner, who was played third base last inning, now moves over to second, and the newcomer, Luke Miles, who just pinch hit, will be at third base as Lavier throws over to first, Tejada sliding back safely. There's a lot of highlighted marks, a lot of pens scratching out on that Purdue side of my scorebook. whole slew of defensive changes as... Will Vogel saying works with Christian Tejada at first and nobody out in the bottom of the eighth. Miami leading at 15 to 8. 10 hits for the Red Hawks, 11 for the Mastodons. Runner goes in Tejada. The throw is going to skip up, go off of the glove, get into the glove of the backup man there. That's Charles Lyons and a stolen base for Christian Tejada. That's his first of the year. That was over from the beginning. He got a great jump, and like I said, if a guy like Tejada or Will Vogelsang gets a good jump, they've got the speed that they're probably getting there, barring an absolutely perfect throw from the catcher. And kudos to Danny Hayden not taking his foot off the pedal here, too, with this aggressive style on the bases. One ball, no strikes on Vogelsang. He waves the bat over his right shoulder. Lavier looks back towards second, now double takes before coming home, and that ball... 84 on the gun that time, missing upstairs 2-0. Oh. Middle infield pinched towards that second base bag. That's Lyons at short and Stoner at second. Big gap through that right side of the infield. Should Will Vokasang try to go that opposite way. Lavier taking a long look back towards second before coming home, and he misses upstairs again 3-0. Vogelsang today, two for three, four runs scored, four RBIs in addition to two walks, swiped a couple of bags along the way. So padding the stats here today, a great day for the senior out of Cincinnati. Trying to add to that total as the 3-0 gets that upper part of the zone. Thought he had a walk for a second, and it's 3-1. and one. Coming into today, Vogel saying five for 17 at the plate, four runs scored, a triple, two home runs, now three on the on the year. Excuse me for Will Vogel saying after a two-run shot in the first. They had a tapping around that second base bag as pitch now comes home and that's a strike on the inner half for and it's three and two. Danny Hayden, a wide stance in that third base coach's box. Hands on his knees, just looking at Tejada as he now looks back towards home. Lavier now looks back towards second base. Tejada still tapping his feet around a little bit. 3-2 comes home. Vogel saying swings, fouls it off just beyond home plate towards the right side. So this Red Hawks team trying to add on to their great season from last year in which they went 37-19, 14-game win streak, best 20-game start in program history at 17-3. and 
tied for the best 30 games, 35 games start at 29 and 6. Trying to get back to that dominance as Vogel saying rips one through the left side of the infield and that gets into left field. Easy play as Vogel saying adds to his toll. That's his fourth hit of the day and runners on the corners for the Red Hawks. Yeah, Tejada had to stay put at third base because he hesitated when that ball was first hit. His first instinct was to retreat. He took a step or two back towards the second base bag until the ball got into left field and then he advanced to third, but just not enough time for him to come around. And you know what? Even if he uh, had plenty of time and, and had the speed to get there, Danny Hayden probably would have said, all right, we're up seven runs. we got two innings left. We'll probably hold you here. Well, it's tough to do with Landon Stevens, especially with nobody out. Bottom of the eighth and a seven-run lead for Miami. Christian Zayata at third, Vogel staying at first. As Stevens today, technically one for two. Runner goes. That's Vogel saying he was trotting down at a leisurely pace then slides up safely as the throw was well late. Now runners in scoring position. Now three stolen bases, two for Vogel saying in this ball game. Red Hawks still trying to pad their stats. 11 hits, 15 runs. Sun starting to shine over this entire ball field. Cloud starting to dissipate as Landon Stevens swings on a curveball. He got out in front of that, and it's one and one. <laughs> Stevens an RBI double in the second. RBI walk in the third when he had the bases loaded, and then walked and scored in the second. Part of a three-run inning for the Red Hawks. Ball and a strike pitch comes home. An early release on the breaking ball and it misses well high at 67 miles an hour to put the count at two and one. Bat over his right shoulder. Stevens anticipates the ball coming home. Fastball high right up at his neck. But that was towards the middle of the zone. It's 3-1. and one. Redox look to be going with a pinch hitter after this to replace Steven Krause. It looks to be Reed Norberg. Redshirt sophomore out of California. Christian Tejada at third. Will Vogel saying at second. 3-1 from Lawveer missing outside, and the bases are loaded for Norberg. So we again to mention. Reed Norberg in the pinch hitting spot will replace Steven Kraus. Redshirt sophomore out of San Diego, 6'2", 208 pounds last year at 287. Started 29 games for Miami, appeared in 36. And he'll be making his first plate appearance of this 2020 campaign. He really came on strong towards the end of last season. Hasn't been able to appear in any game so far, so he's looking to get off to a hot start here. First pitch from Lawveers, a ball that drops to the dirt. Tried to go with a curve ball, but again, a block by Stewart. That's now 1-0 on Norberg. Bases continue to be loaded for Miami. Tejada at third, Vogel saying at second, Stevens at first. Now the 1-0 from Lawveer. He comes set from the stretch. He kicks and deals, 1-0 again. This time missing low, 2-0. Oh. All of you are the sixth pitcher used today by Purdue-Fort Wayne. The first two pitchers, Kissinger and Armstrong, only going an inning. Owen Pyatt only goes the third of an inning. And then he was replaced by Justin Miller, who got him through the majority of this ball game at three and a third. And now Norberg takes the first pitch on the outer half for a strike, two and one. Miller really been the most effective, held the Red Hawks scoreless, only gave up two hits. Walked four batters, though. 
added two strikeouts, and then Sean Ferguson only goes a third of an inning with a strikeout allowed two earned runs on three hits. Ball here now, 2-1 on Norberg. Gets that outer part of the plate, 85 that time on the gun on the fastball. Evens up the count of two aside. That's a pretty pitch and one you really can't do a whole lot with if you're Norberg. So the biggest thing for him, you know, I'm going to take that and I'm going to move on. Again, this is the first at-bat of the season for Reed Norberg. Taking his time as he now waves the bat over his right shoulder and awaits the 2-2. It comes home, and he reaches for it. A nasty curveball by Lavier for a strikeout. That's his second of this ball game. And another guy coming in to pinch hit and replace Charlie Harrigan is Michael Morissette, the transfer out of Tyler Junior College. Morissette sporting an early season faux hawk, which he has dyed red, sticks out of the back of his helmet. We saw a lot of guys last year during the season completely dye their hair bleach blonde. Mm -hmm. This year I wonder if, uh, and with every win it seemed like you know another guy would do it. We'll see if that's the case this year with this red dye. Morissette being the first one on the team that I can see at least. So Michael Morissette, a junior transfer from Tyler Junior College, 6'5", 218 pounds. He waits the first pitch from Law Veer, and he watches it go into the glove of Stewart for a strike at 85 on the gun. And I've been anticipating Michael Morissette for a long time now, let me tell you. So tell I'm, us, Bennett Wise. I met Morissette this past summer when I was working for the Growlers. He was playing for the Battle Creek Bombers, our rival team. Saw he was going to be transferring to Miami, and I'm like, all right, got to meet this guy ASAP. Uh, really athletic kind of guy. I'm surprised he's even listed at first base because uh, in Battle Creek, he really played wherever as he now fouls one off down the right field line and it's 0-2. But he's, he uses that length that he has. I remember one game, they switched him from left field to right field and then back to first base over the span of a ball game. So really, he can, he can really be used wherever. And so I'm excited to see what he can do for, for Danny Hayden's ball club. And Danny Hayden has a lot of those guys, and that's really going to work in his favor as this season goes on, you know, when you want to give a guy a, a day off or a series off. Just plugging and playing, being able to do that with multiple guys is going to be super important for him. He checks his swing. He went around, says the home plate umpire, Deron Brown, and Morissette will take a seat. Back-to-back -back Ks for Andrew Lavier in relief. Now two outs in the bottom of the eighth. Miami still leading by seven. That brings up Cole Andrews. Two for three today. Three run shot in the first. Two run single in the first, in the second, excuse me. But since then, cooled off a little bit, flew out to right, grounded into a double play, and then struck out back in the sixth. Bases continue to be juiced. Landon Stevens at first. Will Vogel saying at second. Christian Tejada at third. Two outs in the first pitch. Two Andrews is upstairs for a ball. Now the 1-0 from Lawveer. Hard shot into the left center gap, and that's going to get by and roll all the way up to the wall. One run will score, now two. And landed Stevens being sent home all the way from first and sliding into third base safely with a three-run triple is Cole Andrews. And the Red Hawks lead 18-8 here in the bottom of the eighth inning. He is up to eight RBIs now, which is just incredible. Driven in almost half of Miami's runs, starting all the way back in the first inning with a three-run dinger. That was just a tough angle, too, by Garrett Lake in center field. Started coming on more towards the second base bag instead of moving to his right and started anticipating it, so the ball just got right by him. And now we have a mound meeting by the Mastodons, and we will have a pitching change here in the bottom of the eighth. Three runs scored already, still two outs in the bottom of the eighth, and we're going to step aside here as we have a pitching change here on Red Hawk Radio.
So the seventh pitcher now being used by the Mastodons. This is Cade Willard. And with that triple by Cole Andrews, that is a Miami single game record for most RBIs. That is number eight. Eight RBIs for Cole Andrews. And we're talking about a guy who flashed immense potential during his freshman year last year and is already off to a hot start in his sophomore year. Eight RBIs, sophomore, two more years plus the rest of this year I in a Miami uniform. I want 16. Whew. Well, <laughs> I don't know if you're getting that tonight, but... Maybe eventually. I doubt it, though. But I also doubt it, but One still, yeah, amazing game by Cole Andrews. So this is Billy uh, Kilpicki to face Cade Willard, and the seventh pitcher used today by the Mastodons. Andrew Lavier's day is done at one and two-thirds. Three hits, three earned runs, one walk, and three strikeouts. Now we have a righty-righty matchup as Willard comes home. Kilpicki swings and pops it up on the infield. Moving over from second base is Luke Miles, and he squeezes the glove for out number three. So an easy inning for Cade Willard. One batter faced and one out. We go to the top of the ninth. Miami leading 18-8 to here on Red Hawk Radio. Top of the ninth here from Hayden Park. And now a pitching change for the Miami Redhawks. Michael Spinozzi only goes one inning, retires three batters. And now it's Jay Wilson to take the mound, who hasn't played a ball game in two years. Very similar to Grant Hartwig, who we saw early in this ball game. This is Jay Wilson's first appearance since 2018. He hasn't appeared in a game yet this year. And he's actually missed two entire years due to injury. He missed all of what was supposed to be his freshman year. You know, he redshirted due to injury, came back in 2018, threw a full season, appearing in 13 games, and then last year missed the entire year due to, due to another injury. So, unfortunate string of events for Jay Wilson as he gets the first out here and he's back on the mound. I'm sure he's just relieved about that. That was a fly out to left by Garrett Lake. Actually, excuse me, that's uh, another hitting change. Trying to get that to you in a second. That was number one, Jacob Lawson. He was a freshman who just flew out to left. 
Now Jay Wilson up 1-0 on Evan Huffman, who was already 0 for 1 in this ball game to replace the DH in this one, Alex Evenson. The 0 1 comes home, another strike at 88 on the fastball, 0 2. Similar situation to Hartwig as well, where Wilson's just coming at batters. We saw that first pitch swinging was the last batter, now 0 and 2. He's running up on the following guy. Here's a little tapper back to Wilson. He's going to throw on to first base and get out number two. So 1 3 put out to put two away for Jay Wilson, making quick work of a couple batters he faced, only three pitches to get those two outs. And now the final chance for the Mastodons as Trenton Stoner takes that right side of the box. The righty, Jay Wilson, comes set. He kicks and deals, comes home. Another fastball, 92 on the gun that time for a strike. He hasn't lost any velocity in those two years of injury. Sitting in the low 90s with that fastball. That's, that's among the better, better velocities on Miami. This one's fouled off on the short end of the bat behind home plate. It's 0-2 with two outs. Jay Wilson, Redshirt Jr. out of Loveland, Ohio, 6'5", 222 pounds. Trying to get back into baseball shape. And Red Hawks leading 18-8. Wilson from the windup, 0-2. Tapped foul. This one just gets behind Andrews. Stoner able to stay alive. Infield playing back for the Red Hawks, anticipating a ground ball as the 0-2 comes home a little bit extra on that fastball. Overthrew it and it misses to the right, or excuse me, the left. If you're Jay Wilson, it's one and two. What a story, missing two years because of injury. Coming back and now the one two oh, and he hits the batter right on the forearm. So couldn't make this inning go one, two, three as now Ryan Millett will come up for the Mastodons. He was pretty effective in 2018, the last time we saw him, too. Finished 2-1 and one with a 4.6 earn run average. And, and opponents only hit 267 off him. So, you know, a guy that was kind of a weekday starter and started some games, mixed in relief appearances. He can be used all over the place wherever Danny Hayden needs him. Yeah, it's a good situation to bring him back in. Just let him work. No pressure in this whatsoever. Just get his feel, get that itch for competition back. So this is Millette swinging on the 1-0. Popped up out of play left field side, and that'll head into the concourse. Puts the count at 1-1. One one. Millette reached on a drop third strike in the seventh. That's when he came in to relieve Robert Young the third. And that was a part of a two-run inning. That could have been out number three, but because of that drop third strike, extended out the ball game. Then Drew Rich with a two-run triple to add to Purdue Fort Wayne's six runs to make it eight. Another foul ball, one ball, two strikes. Jay Wilson trying to get it out of this ball game. Wilson now comes set, has the ball and his glove at the letters, looks over towards first and comes home and a reaching foul ball that just gets tapped back to the screen by Millette to keep the count at one and two. The Hawks trying to get back to 500 after being swept last weekend by the Texas A&M Aggies. A 21st Texas ranked Texas A&M Aggies, excuse me. And the 1-2 swung on and missed. Jay Wilson with a strikeout to end this ball game and a dominant 18-8 win for the Miami Red Hawks. And Chris, player of the game, no matter what, Cole Andrews. It has to be. I mean, with eight RBIs, a program record single game for Miami. Just incredible game by him, and you were kind of waiting for this offense to explode. Only five combined runs all of last weekend against Texas A&M, then six on Friday night, seven yesterday, and then 18 today. So we were kind of waiting for that offensive explosion, and it was led by Cole Andrews. An outstanding ball game, and, and Will Vogel saying, too, offensively, coming alive for the Red Hawks, three for four, five total runs scored, four RBIs, two walks, 
swipe three bags in the process too. He also has to get a hat. I mean, hat it, off. it it works for you know Andrews. It's awesome to have a guy like Vogelsang hitting just a spot or two in front of him, and then you know vice versa. It's nice to have Cole Andrews hitting a spot or two behind you if you're on base because he's going to drive you in oftentimes. So just an all-around great game by Miami. You know, the pitching is going to have to come around a little bit, giving up eight runs today. But I thought a lot of guys got in today and did, did some solid jobs, showed some um, flashes of things to come this year. So I'm sure Danny Hayden will have nothing but positive things to say after this ballgame. Final lines for each team, eight runs, 11 hits, and two errors for the Mastodons of Purdue Fort Wayne. 18 runs, 12 hits, and one error for the Miami Red Hawks. Purdue Fort Wayne will drop to 3-4 three and four on the year. Miami improves to 3-3, three and three, regains a sweep after being swept last weekend, as we've mentioned, and overall a dominant win and series win for the Miami Red Hawks. That will do it here on Red Hawk Radio. For my partner, Chris Vanell, I'm Bennett Wise. We will talk to you next time the Red Hawks are at home. In the meantime, Tuesday, the Red Hawks will head up to Dayton to take on the Flyers, and the Macedons will move to New Mexico State on Friday for a three-game series there. So again, we will talk to you soon at the next Miami home game here on Red Hawk Radio.